sleep is highly individual. Yeah. And I know there's many myths out there that you're keen to bust, one of them being that we all need eight hours. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was part of the motivation for for writing a lifetime because I think that there's been a tendency to, to, to feel that, you know, we have to have a certain, we've got to get eight hours. And I remember one person came up to me and they said, I don't get eight hours of sleep. Am I going to die? And I sort of said, well, I can assure you, you will die, but it may not be anything to do with not getting eight hours of sleep. And, you know, because I'm being a bit flippant, but but actually the natural sort of span for humans is six hours to maybe 10, 10 and a half hours. And so that's in the in the natural range. And I think people get very anxious that if they're not getting eight hours, you know, they're going to, it's, it's going to be a disaster. Now, I think you have to be careful um, because the, the tired brain is very good at fooling itself that it's okay. So you need to really be uh, tough about assessing what your sleep needs are. Um, and if you can function optimally during the day, if you're feeling fine, then chances are you've had a good night of sleep. If you need an alarm clock to drive you out of bed in the morning, if it takes you a long time to wake up, if you crave caffeinated drinks, if your family, friends, work colleagues say, oh, you're being a bit, you know, where's your sense of humour? You know, you're a bit more irritable. And critically, if given the opportunity to sleep longer on free days or indeed on holiday, you sleep much longer. That's all telling you you're not getting enough sleep. So what we all have to do as individuals is define how much sleep that we need for optimal daytime performance. And I guess that would also depend on what we're doing, right? Because let's say, I don't know, that you have define that, hey, you know what, I keep hearing about the eight hours, but I think I sleep for, I don't know, six hours 30 each night or six hours 45. Yeah. And I'm fine. And I wake up without an alarm clock and i am got energy and I feel emotionally quite with it, you know. Yeah. But then let's say you start, I don't know, training for a half marathon or maybe at the weekends you go on long runs or something. It's also having that awareness to go, well, yeah, in the week, I may be okay with this amount. But actually, if I'm really exerting myself physically and I have a desk job Monday to Friday, maybe I need more at the weekend. And I guess the reason, I don't know what your view would be on that. One of the reasons I asked that is because I I think Roger Federer is well known to, is it 10 hours or 12 hours a night? He, I think he talks a lot about how much sleep he has and how important that is to his optimal performance as a tennis player. Yeah. A few little subtleties there. Do you think physical activity levels um, make a difference in terms of how much we need? And I guess, how would you put all that together? Well, of course, the, the famous long sleeper was Albert Einstein, um, who basically sat at his desk uh, for, for every day. Um, and he needed, he, he craved 10 hours of sleep. So I think that it's probably influenced by athletic performance. Uh, and certainly... Um, there are some data suggesting that really strong training is associated with slightly longer sleep, but it's not an overwhelmingly increased amount of sleep. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, Federer just needs that amount of sleep yeah. um, and for his optimal performance, same way that Einstein did. And, I, you know, in the book, I talk, I compare Einstein to Salvador Dali. You do. Um, and, um, you know, I sort of, it, it, it's great, you know, undergraduate lectures, you know, I say, well, Einstein, a classic, sort of slept 10, 10 and a half hours, so, yeah, perfect example of long sleep genius. And then, you know, one of the students said, well, what about Salvador Dali? You know, he only, he, he didn't sleep at all, really. And he, his trick was, of course, to hold a, a metal spoon um, um, uh, in his hand and sit in a chair and when the spoon dropped from his hand when he fell asleep it hit a metal plate on the floor and woke him up but of course Dali was the first to recognize that his altered state of mind because of his chronic lack of sleep gave him the sort of surreal vision to generate the art that he generated um yeah um. so it depends what's the goal <laughs> it depends what right? the goal, if the goal is, yeah. is to hallucinate and have an altered state of consciousness yeah and you need that for your job, you know what? Sleep yeah. deprive yourself all you want. Yeah, it, that's true. <laughs> it, it may make you impossible to live with, um, as uh, Dali, of course, was. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but if you want an altered state of consciousness, then decide, you know, d d deprive yourself of sleep. Well, maybe now's a good point in the conversation to make the case for sleep, right? First of all, how sleep deprived are we as a society? And then secondly, 
what are those consequences? Yes, uh, sleep deprivation varies a lot because, of course, sleep need varies a lot. Um, But I think on average, people are saying that we're sleeping one, maybe two hours less than we were in the 1950s. And I, and I, I'm, I'm, I think those data are, are pretty robust. And certainly that's the case in, in adolescence, big time. Um, and so what are the consequences? Well, short-term sleep loss, we see changes in our emotions uh, and our cognitive performance. So uh, we increased levels of irritability the failure to process information accurately. We do stupid and unreflective things. We are less empathetic. I mean, it's really fascinating. You, we, we fail to pick up the social signals uh, of friends and family. Um, we're less socially connected. We have uh, reduced capacity to remember things. We are less creative. Um, so all the things, reduced sense of humour. I mean, you know, all the yeah. things that make us this extraordinary creature Creature, you know, this amazing humans, you know, all this creativity and wonderful and interconnectedness goes as a result of, of, of even short term sleep loss. Longer term, as many individuals are experiencing at the moment, is associated with this falling asleep uncontrollably, so microsleeps. And it's estimated in the States that 100,000 crashes on the American freeway are as a result of people falling asleep at the wheel. The American Automobile Association suggests it's much greater than that, perhaps as high as 300,000. And of course, if you're falling asleep at the wheel, you you can't stop yourself. So those crashes tend to be really bad crashes. We also see that there's changes in immune uh, responses. So it's likely because we're chronically tired, we're activating in a sustained way the stress axis. And that's going to push up blood pressure. It's going to throw glucose into the circulation. So it pre then disposes to things like obesity, type 2 diabetes, And indeed, because of the suppression of the immune system, higher rates of infection and indeed um, cancer. Some very convincing studies showing that night shift work, for example, uh, night shift nurses have higher rates of colorectal cancer and breast cancer. In fact, those data are now so good that the World Health Organization has listed night shift work as a probable carcinogen. So so I, I think the really key point is that chronic sleep loss is so much more than feeling feeling tired at an inappropriate time. It's associated with an impact upon our health at every level. Yeah, I mean, what you just went through there, it it impacts negatively our our day-to-day lives. You mentioned empathy. I mean, what do we need for good quality relationships with partners, children, work colleagues, family? We need empathy. Yeah, and, 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 and or invariably in the workplace, you need creativity. You need people to be able to work together. You want to reduce irritability. You need often yeah. a good sense of humour. And so really, we should be really promoting good sleep to Im- improve productivity. Yeah, it speaks to something you said earlier on in our conversation that when we are sleep deprived, we forget all the positive experiences and remember the negative ones, yeah. which of course completely alters your view and perception of the world. It feels like this dark, scary place rather than an uplifting, hopeful, joyful place. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, yes, these short-term consequences, but also these pretty scary long-term consequences. Now, one thing I really appreciate about the messages you try and put out there into the public is you, you really seem to be trying to help promote health without scaring people. Now, of course, these statistics are scary. And there's two groups of people I want to keep at the forefront of our mind now as we think about these negative side effects. We've mentioned shift work, and I want to talk about shift work because what I read in your book is that one in eight UK workers currently are shift workers. That's probably only going to increase. That's a lot of people. And I can't imagine what it's like for a shift worker to just hear what you said the WHO say, which is yeah. a probable carcinogen. Yeah. That's not a nice thing to hear no. if you work shifts, if you're a, whatever, if you're a nurse looking after people to help their health and you think, yeah, but at the same time, I'm wrecking mine in the process. So shift work is something I want to talk about. But also the other thing I've noticed as I've been trying to raise awareness of sleep now in books and podcasts for maybe five years, unwittingly, 
we can often end up scaring people and making them feel worse and more anxious. Now, young parents often will get in touch and say, look, you know, uh, love what you love what you said. You know, I understand about sleep, but I'm really worried. Mm-hmm. My three month old doesn't sleep through the night, you know, or whatever is going on. So many parents get really scared when they hear this sort of stuff. So, if we address parents first of all, short term sleep deprivation, long term, is it okay for a few years of a parent sleep deprived? You know, help us sort of get less scared about that if you yeah, can. Yeah, well, I think there's two issues here. Um, one thing that that our society, or the de- in the developed nations at least, uh, has shifted very rapidly from the extended family yeah. to the nuclear family, where the parents become the sole providers for their children. Um, and it's usually the mother. And uh, what's happened up until fairly recently is that Childcare was a distributed activity. And so when the mum got tired, there was an aunt or a sister or a friend who would take over so that the mum can get some sleep. And if you look at the primate societies, uh, you see that uh, care is distributed across the group. We have never evolved to be the sole uh, parents, as it were, of, of our children. And I think the first point to make is that Young mums in particular, but, 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 but both parents, uh, should not be afraid to reach out. And I think there's this sort of terrible guilt that I can't cope because I'm feeling tired. Well, no surprise. We never evolved to, to look after our children in this manner. So before babies are born, it's really important to think about the support network that you can put in place to, to, to try and mitigate some of the, the chronic sleep loss. Now, what are the long-term consequences of this? It's, it's not clear. Uh, I suspect that there are probably buffers that kick in that actually um, prevent some of the, some of the damaging effects of, of chronic sleep loss during those sort of few months. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and in fact, I think it's a really important area of, of, of study. Yeah. I think, you know, what you said there, I think is really helpful. First of all, just recognize that the way we're bringing kids up now is tough. Yeah. We never have to do it like this. You know, recently, Russell, my wife's father has been away in Kenya for a couple of months to see his yeah. family. And my mother-in-law has been staying with us on and off for a couple of months. Mm. And let me tell you the difference. It, you just, it's its little things, but just having a third adult in the house yes. when it comes to childcare, it, it it's not just one more person. It, it seems to have changed everything. The whole dynamic the changes. The whole dynamic yeah. changed. Yeah. I, I was Absolutely. like, this is incredible. This is what humans have always done. Yet yeah. many of us have moved away for work, for opportunity. We don't have those support systems. So I thought that hopefully takes the pressure off people to at least go, yes, I know it's hard, but yes, it is hard. It really is hard. You're, mm. not, you're not broken. It's not that you can't no. cope. No, none of us can cope with that. Yep. So I think that's a really nice message. But also that message, you can reach out, you know, yes. maybe you need to phone a friend and say, hey, listen, I'm knackered. Could I just have a nap? Could you come while I have a nap? And it's not a sign of weakness. Yeah. It's, it's actually, you know, em- embracing our biology in a sense. Um, and and I, it's, it's tragic that I think that young parents don't know that um, and feel guilty about it. It's, it's simply wrong. And, it, and it's, you know, it's so many unintended consequences that we're facing at the moment and and sort of with increased wealth and independence you know we think right you know we don't have to live with our parents anymore or we can move a long way away from them and yet we've we've lost something in the process i mean i was you know my my i was my i very close to my grandparents who looked after me while my my mother was working and it was a as you as you say it was a meant you know a, a big thing so mummy's coming home and it was all you know excitement and yeah. and you have that dynamic environment um and clearly you know we are where we are but but people shouldn't be afraid to reach out i think that's so important let's talk about shift work um there's all kinds of things there's a huge section on shift work in the book which i think will be very helpful for anyone. We mentioned how many people, of course, 
are shift workers. Yeah. We mentioned the potential health problems of that. Yes. You know, something I read in your book, which I found fascinating, was that over 90% of night shift workers, was it even 97%? 97, yeah. They don't adapt. No. And, and so that's going back to light again. So you've got relatively dim light uh, within the workplace, within the office or the factory. And then, of course, on the journey home uh, or on the journey in, you're going to, ex- or during the day, you're going to experience bright natural light. And the clock always defers to the brighter light signal as being daytime. So the assumption for, b- b- by employers... The clock, just, the clock always defers to the brighter light signal. I think that's a really yeah. powerful thing. And that's why we with. don't shift. And in fact, there, there's one group, um, there's a lovely study from the University of Surrey, Josephina Rent, and what, you know that, that 3%, some of them are North Sea oil workers, oh. because what happens is they're out on the rig at night under these great arc lights, and then they're in windowless metal boxes during the day. And they do switch, and so they become nocturnal, as it were. Wow. Then, of course, it's really tough for them because then they have two weeks of shore leave and they're completely maladapted to their friends and family. But, the, the, you know, the serious issue is you, you, you don't adapt. And, and, and so I remember chatting to uh, the chairman of the CBI oh, many years ago now and, and, you know, giving a speech saying, we're going to cure the problems of British industry by running it on a 24-7 basis. No need to build lots of offices in London, you know, the rush hour, et cetera, et cetera. Deeply well-meaning individual. No idea of the biological consequences and the assumption that, that the clock will adapt to the demands of working at night. And for 97% of people, it doesn't. We're not machines, we're human no, beings, right? Absolutely, yes. And uh, I think you could you could you could apply that across all kinds of different well, things in society. It, it is fascinating because we we are we've achieved so much. I mean, you know, it's we shouldn't. I mean, it's phenomenal what we've achieved as as a as a as a as a, as a species. Um, but we are. It comes with some some massive arrogance. And what we've assumed is that we can do whatever we like whenever we choose. And because we've invaded the night cheaply with electricity since the 1950s onwards, we've invaded the night and have thrown away that really important part of our biology, which is sleep. That's interesting. It was only in the 1950s when we've... Big acceleration. When we've yeah. really aggressively invaded yeah. the night. That's not long. No. Through an evolution lens, that's just a blink. Yeah, and, and clearly, you know, we've been creeping in. You know, yeah. The aristocrats were using candles. And in fact, a, a sign of wealth was you would eat later in the evening and you'd light your... But remember, a candle, you know, in the early 19th century was the equivalent of a, of a working man's daily wage. So only the rich yeah. could, could have light. And of course, why would you burn fat, which is what candles were made of, when this is food? And of course, food... Food was incredibly scarce for so many people, working people, 200 years, 150 years ago. We'll stay on shift work for the minute, but this doesn't just apply to shift work. Driving, driving tired, and a pretty alarming statistic in your book about what it means to drive at 4am for most people. Yeah, there's, well, well, Drew Dawson has done a wonderful study. Drew Dawson's based in, in Australia. And he compared the cognitive performance, the loss of one's ability to process information um, uh, across the day and found a very you know poor cognition around about four o'clock in the morning where, where it got to its lowest point. Um, and he compared that with the loss of cognitive ability with consuming sufficient alcohol to make you legally drunk. And on the scale, it was about a minus 15 um, dropping cognition when you were legally drunk. But at four o'clock in the morning, it was minus 20. So so if, if listeners take nothing from, from this at all, other than the fact that if you're driving at four o'clock in the morning, your ability to process information is worse than if you were legally drunk. Okay, this, this is big, right? Because we've touched a few times on this this whole societal condition, what we're being asked to do now or what we think we have to do to fit in with society versus yes. what's biologically optimal. Some people, of course, have to get up early for work. Yeah. Some people now drive through the night. Yes. Lorry drivers, you know, big yep. big cargo in the back. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I'm sure they've got certain regulations, certain things that they do in order to be less tired yes. uh, at that time. But, you know, driving at 4 a.m., Yeah for most of us being worse than when we might be legally drunk. That's pretty alarming. It's extraordinary. Uh, Because also then let's think about, look, I'm, I don't really 
do this anymore. But if I think about my social culture in my 20s and 30s, you know, you go to a mate's wedding, mm. right? There'll be some late nights, a few drinks. And then you drive home on the Sunday, you know, mm. yeah, you're, you're, you know, uh, just to be super clear, you know, you, you, you're fully sober, yes. you know, but it culturally it's okay. Oh yeah, I'm knackered. I've just got to drive now for four hours. Yeah. But we're putting people's lives at risk, we not are, just our own. We're, we're, we're putting yeah. other people's lives at risk. So, so culturally, yeah. this idea of driving when tired, I think is something we all need to face. Well, I think it's like smoking. We're not only um, endangering our own health, but um, the collateral damage is that we're harming uh, other people. But people will do are, this. Uh, yes. And uh, but I think it's, again, it's, it's a matter of education and, and a failure to appreciate. Um, you, you know, junior doctors, a study published fairly recently showed that 57% had either had a crash or a near miss on the drive after the night shift. Uh, so, so now, again, we're, we're going into scary territory. But the key point is there's stuff we can do about it. We're not going to put the 24-7 society, mm. you know, genie back in its bottle. So what can we do to mitigate yeah. some of these problems? Well, knowing that we're going to be vulnerable to having a crash on the drive home, then we, sh or, or employers, and I think there's a serious duty of care yeah. here, is they should make available or subsidise the use of devices you can put on the dashboard that measure head nod or the fact that the car is veering and alert you to that and and, and that you know an alarm goes off and make sure you you know you're woken up and of course many high-end German cars ha now have this technology they, really? built built in yeah um, but that's something that that, that that could be done knowing that um, night shift workers have higher rates of cancer coronary heart disease diabetes 2 etc cetera, etc cetera. why don't we institute uh, higher frequency health checks you know every six months for these individuals to catch these conditions before they come mm. become chronic what food do we provide for our night shift workers you know higher rates of cancer you know coronary heart heart disease, all the rest of it, high fat, high sugar. Nobody, to my knowledge, is actually supplying easy to digest, high protein snacks to their workforce throughout the night. Now, it's tricky because if you're tired, you're programmed to eat more sugar. Um, but, but, but at least we should make that option available. But why, why high protein? Um, because it doesn't have the same impact as carbohydrates and fats on coronary heart disease and indeed cancer. But that would be quite easy, right? Let's say for yes. a hospital which is staffed at night, yeah. it would be quite easy either to have those snacks or to work with a nutritionist and make in bulk protein shakes full of phytonutrient-rich foods that are easy to digest, that are tasty, that they could give people. It, it's not that hard. No, and, and in fact, I think there's a phenomenal commercial opportunity here. Somebody should develop this and make it available to, you know, a, a very significant percentage of the yeah. workforce. Yeah. Uh, so, and the other area I think is is education in some sectors uh, the divorce rate is six times higher uh, in the night shift compared to the day shift and six times, six times. So what we should be providing is education, not only for the individual who's doing the night shift, so they're aware of some of the consequences, but so that the people they live with also understand that they're not turning into monsters. But this is a, a kind of the biological consequence of driving your biology outside of its normal range. Um, and one other area, which I think is worth trying is that we talked about this great diversity of chronotype, whether you're a morning type or an evening type across the population. Well, wouldn't it be smart to chronotype your workforce so that, for example, the late types did the later shift and the morning types did the morning shift? What you want to avoid, of course, is putting a late type onto a morning shift, mm. which is a, is a really bad idea. So, uh, you know, as I say, we've got to be pragmatic, but I think there are things that we can do now to mitigate some of these problems. Yeah. We don't want to be too scary, but um, I can't stop thinking about that as a doctor myself, that 57% figure. Yeah. I have told this story, I think at least twice on this podcast, where when I was a SHO, a senior house officer, so I think second or third year after qualifying, after a, what would it have been, probably a 36-hour shift, certainly yeah. between 30 and 36 hours, I properly fell asleep on the M60 in traffic. Um, yeah. Thankfully... I, I think I fell asleep in a traffic jam and then I was only woken up by horns because the jam had, you know, moved yeah. on. So, so yeah. you know, it could have been a lot worse, Yes, right? This is scary because there are people 
around the country, around the world right now, who are vulnerable are dying as a consequence of their jobs. That sounds extreme. I don't think what I've just said is extreme based upon what I'm reading. And you, you mentioned duty of care for employers. Yes. Surely this should have been put in place yesterday. Like, is it justifiable for people in shift work to be getting in a car now? Where does the culpability lie? What if they have an accident? Is it is that personal responsibility or is it, no, but my, my employer didn't do anything? Or, and of course, this comes into finance and expenses, but providing taxis. Well, that's what the Royal Perth Hospital, at least when I was visiting uh, Western Australia, would actually do. They would actually provide taxis to get people home. Yeah. And I know there's an expense thing here, but we're talking about lives here, not just that individual's life. So... Yeah, that really that really hits home big time. Uh, and and you know, there's a very poignant description in the book of a police officer um, who contacted me actually several years ago, saying, "What can we do?" You know, I just had a friend who, after the night shift, fell asleep at the wheel and drove his car into a tree and was killed outright. Um, and nobody's warning us that this is going on. And that's part of the educational piece because I think if people realised of the danger of doing this, they'd think twice about it yeah. um, and, and try and get some something else in place. I mean, maybe we should be making sure that there's, I don't know, a, somewhere to sleep um, uh, uh, after the night shift so you weren't driving yeah. home chronically tired. You know, it's these sorts of things that, that we need to think about. There's, there are, again, we're not going to cure it, but we can mitigate some of the problems. And it's not rocket science. No. It's it's low-hanging fruit that we could institute now across the workforce and make a difference. I, I don't know when my behaviour around this started to change, but I'm pretty diligent these days over when I drive now. I don't need to drive much anymore yeah. for work. I remember in one of the practices I used to work at, you know, there was a probably 45 minutes to an hour commute each way on a motorway and depending on traffic conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And I appreciate not everyone is in a position to make active decisions, depends on work, finances, all kinds of things. But when I'm weighing up how to get somewhere and whether to take my car or not, how tired I'm going to be absolute plays in my decision making. Mm. And I think, you know, as I think about it, Russell, I think one of the first times it really struck me it was 2015, 2016, I was making a documentary for BBC One. I don't think this bit actually aired in the programme in the end, but is it in Guildford, where is the uh, driving simulators? I think so, yes. I think what, what happened, I can't remember the exact ins and outs, but one of the participants, yeah. we put them in the simulator and we watched them drive and then we compared it with one night's sleep deprivation and then alcohol. Yeah, And it was noticeable after sleep deprivation it's just like you said with that research it was worse yeah. than when they'd been drinking yep. I was like wait a minute that's just fatigue and their their reaction time to things popping up in the simulator to when they press the brake was significantly increased so yep. I think that possibly has played into my head for many years about that um, number two I think a, th- a point here is that you, you bring up this to micro sleeps mm. right number one what is a micro sleep? And number two, I've heard you say before, the thing about these micro sleeps is you don't know they're going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so can you speak to that a little so bit? So it's it's really so micro sleep is essentially an uncontrollable and, and an unpredictable episode of sleep, and so you can be going along and you will just fall asleep. And of course, that's extremely dangerous if you're if you're driving. Um, and uh, so, so people think they're okay, and then they will just sort of have a, have a micro sleep and then a, a crash or or, or, or whatever. Um, and it's it's frightening because so many people say, "Oh yeah, you know, I've had one of those." I was sort of nodding, and then I realised I was sort of in the next lane. And but for the grace of God, you know, yeah. you would be killed, or you'd have killed somebody else. Well, you mentioned in your book all these things. What Chinob the the Chinob Bill, oh, yeah. nuclear disaster, it was it a Selby crash in Air India? Like yeah. you've mentioned all this stuff. Can you maybe speak yeah, to some I of mean, those? One of, the, one of the really interesting ones, I think, was the, the Air India flight where where the pilot was, was landing the aircraft and then fell uncontrollably asleep. And the plane hit the deck um, with a huge loss of life. Now, how do we know he fell asleep? 
because you could hear snoring in the cockpit recorder. And, you know, this is not something that he would have wanted to do. But, and, it, and it sort of really illustrates the, the sort of the, the fact that you have no control over these microsleeps. But if you're chronically tired, that's what's going to happen. And, you know, the Exxon Valdez oil tanker that hit the reef off the coast of Alaska. Now, everybody says, oh, it's because the captain was drunk. Well, yes, he was drunk and I, he was asleep in his cabin. And it was a chronically tired, inexperienced individual. And they were telling him, turn the ship you're going to hit the reef but he couldn't process the information because he was so tired and it's a really good illustration again of one's chronic tiredness it prevents you from processing information accurately and you know it, it, we've sort of touched on this but this is what's so dangerous because the tired brain is so tired it can't detect how tired it is and we can yeah. fool and we can fool ourselves that we're okay whereas we're not i actually and, and doing that flight to California relatively regularly these days, maybe three to four times a year. And two weeks ago I went and I tried something different for the very first time. And I've got to say, I had the least jet lag I've ever had on one of my trips to California. And, you know, I changed multiple variables. It's very hard to say which one exactly it was. But on the flight out there, so it was a morning flight from London, so that would be the middle of the night in California, I put on some blue light blockers on the flights and blue light blockers for a little bit of time and I was reading, but then I would close my eyes. I put a shade on my eyes and I would just try and sleep. I couldn't sleep that well, but at least I didn't expose myself to light. Then at the time of morning or what would have been morning in California, I took off my night shades. I did not put on my blue light blockers and I actually watched a film. So I was exposing myself to blue light from yeah. my screen yeah. to sort of trick my body, say, hey, you're on morning time. So. I've never done that before. The other thing is, and I think we'll go here next, the, the other thing I've done a lot recently is reduce my caffeine intake a lot. And I think that often when I used to travel, I was so habituated to having caffeine that sometimes I would wake up um, in the new time zone with a bit of a headache because my body was expecting caffeine earlier. It didn't have it. And I think that that was artificially waking me up. So, yeah. you know, a few things I did differently, but... You know, caffeine is such a popular topic, right? And we don't want to be, um, you know, start off this conversation on a downer. But, <laughs> you know, let's go into caffeine. I mean, how much of a sleep disruptor is caffeine? I mean, it it is quite significant. And one of the problems, um, you know, with those long haul flights, and I would actually love to speak with, you know, Virgin or British Airways about this. Um, they serve caffeine liberally. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing they serve is alcohol. And I'd love to speak about that too, because both of those are the very best ways to A, disrupt your sleep and B, actually make your uh, make it much harder for your 24-hour biological circadian clock to readjust. Both of them those will, will actually take away those fingers on the wristwatch and sort of or slow the progression down. Um, but caffeine is a misunderstood drug. Certainly... It's Everyone. a drug, right? You use the term it drug, is, and that's interesting. It is a drug. Um, it's what we call a psychoactive stimulant. Um, everyone knows that caffeine can help alert you and sort of keep you awake. That's the thing that's most known. Um, caffeine, if you look at some data, is probably the second most traded commodity on the surface of the planet after oil, which I think says everything about our wow. sleep-deprived state. The other thing about caffeine, however, that most people don't realize is the time that it is in your system. So most drugs have what we call a half-life, the amount of time it takes for half of that drug to be essentially excreted out your system. Caffeine has a half-life of about six or seven hours, and it's a little dependent on what type of gene that you have to sort of metabolize the caffeine, but on average, it's about that. But what's interesting is that caffeine has a quarter life of about 12 hours. What this means is that if you have a cup of coffee at noon, a quarter of that caffeine is still circulating around your brain at midnight. Wow. So to put that in context, it would be the equivalent of getting into bed and just before you turn the light out, you swig a quarter of a cup of Starbucks and you hope for a good night of sleep. It, you know, you would never do that because, yeah. you know, but that's exactly, unfortunately, what people do, you know, um, completely innocently. By drinking caffeine, you know, still too late in the afternoon. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge problem. It, it's it's a I, th I think it's a big problem in society. If you, I mean, 
Another way to quantify this is if you just look, and I've checked out the data from the Financial Times, the number of Starbucks coffee houses that have arisen <laughs> over the past 30 years is just like an exponential increase. And I think that is an expression of how we're self-medicating our state of sleep deprivation in developed nations. And well, cafe uh, culture is just growing it, you know, exponentially yeah. now, right? It's the new... You know, I, I talk about something, it's almost like a new new pub culture. It's cafe culture. Yeah. You, know, you hang out with your friends, you meet up, you get your drink. Typically, it'll be a caffeinated drink. Yeah. Um, we've now got school kids. You know, I saw in a local village I was walking through recently, you know, after school, you know, I popped into a cafe to get, I think, uh, a bottle of water. Uh, I can't really remember, but I, I popped in and I saw a group of school kids. They must have been maybe 13 or 14 after school. They are sitting in the cafe with their caffeinated drinks, you know, doing their homework together, catching up, whatever. I thought, wow, you know, this has become endemic in society now. We, you know, you call it a drug. I agree with you. It is a psychoactive substance that we, you know, we, we use liberally. We let our children have it. We, you know, we're not even, you know, we often don't think about the implications of that. And so many patients of mine tell me that, Dr. Chachi, I know, you know, if caffeine can be a problem for some people, I'm not one of those. Caffeine is fine for me. But more often than not, when they either reduce their intake or cut it out completely, the sleep quality goes up. Yeah. And, um, I, and you know, Sachin Panda, um, Professor Panda, who, you know, I know you know very well, you both sort of follow each other's research. He was on the podcast a few weeks ago. And, you know, he was saying routinely every year he will he will have a bit of a detox from caffeine. He'll go off caffeine. And he says, when I do that, yeah, I have a headache for a few days, but my sleep always improves. I've got more energy and my productivity dramatically increases. And I think that says it all, really. It does. And, I, you know, a number of points that you made that I'd love to circle back around to. Firstly, caffeine is the only psychoactive stimulant that we do give to our children readily, which, you know, is, I think, a concern. And I'm not trying to be sort of, you know, finger pointing or finger wagging. Again, I think it's just that parents probably don't understand the impact of caffeine in that regard. Um, I think the the second point comes on to your comment of some people say, look, I'm one of those people who can drink a cup of coffee in the evening, have an espresso after dinner, and I fall asleep fine and I stay asleep. Now, even if that's true, there was an alarming study that was done where they gave people just one single cup of coffee, a dose of 200 milligrams of caffeine, standard cup of coffee. And then they measured the quality of their deep sleep by tracking these big, powerful brain waves, these glorious, beautiful, deep brain waves that bathe um, uh, all of our brain during deep sleep at night. And it helps also restore the body. And what they found was that just one dose of caffeine in the evening decreased the amount of deep sleep by 20 percent. Now, you would have to normally age by about 15 years to produce that type of a deficit in your deep sleep. Or you can do it every single night by having a cup of coffee. And what's interesting is that those people will wake up the next morning. They won't remember waking up because they may not have woken up, but the quality of their deep sleep was so poor that they will still then feel unrestored and unrefreshed by their sleep. I need they, more caffeine. <laughs> and, and so here is the irony that now they're starting to reach for two cups of coffee rather than one. And so develops this dependency cycle, this sort of addiction spiral, as it were. So I think people are perhaps unaware of the, the true impact of caffeine, how long it sticks around within your system. And even if you feel that you're immune to that evening cup of coffee, how it will still impact your sleep, even though consciously you know nothing about it well i think you know you raise a really important point there matthew about you know knowledge and awareness you know none of us are pointing fingers you know we you know i understand caffeine is everywhere you know i probably used to over drink caffeine uh, and i've altered my behavior as i've learned more and more about the research and i think what we're trying to do is raise awareness of you know caffeine is a sleep disruptor there's just no question about that and you know, we can dress it up any way we want, but it is a sleep disruptor. So if anyone is listening to this, if that story that Matthew just mentioned resonates with you, I'd really sort of encourage you to have a little think about your caffeine usage and just see if, can you, you know, can you wind it down a little bit? Can you see, you know, bit by bit, if by reducing it, it improves your quality of sleep? The recommendation I make it in my book is enjoy your caffeine before noon. And I say enjoy, because I get it. People love it. Right? I love a good cup of coffee, but I will not have caffeine after midday. 
Yeah, and I, you know, I've now actually done what Sachin uh, has done. I, I would, I routinely go through sort of a caffeine detox, um, and right now I'm caffeine free. But you know, I too would enjoy that cup of coffee or a nice strong cup of, you know, um, Yorkshire tea. Uh, I have no relationship with them, by the way, um, in the mornings. And I also love the the coffee culture as well. You know, I go out with friends and we grab coffee all the time. And I love that. And I, I want people to embrace it because I think it's fantastic that there's a social movement sort of circulating around that. Um, all I would say, though, is that, you know, decaffeinated coffee is, is actually really quite good. And I would struggle. You know, I'd love to do the sort of, the, you know, the Coke Pepsi challenge with decaf and caffeinated. Just in terms of the taste, you will probably notice that it wouldn't give you sort of the shakes or that sort of slightly anxious state. And you probably know the difference. But I've really become enamored with decaffeinated coffee and wow. all of its flavors. And I love the cafe bar culture. So love to embrace that. But I do like what you're saying uh, about you sort of patience just thinking a little bit about caffeine and considering it and just trying to try the experiment you know sort of set yourself the task give it a go and see if it works for you yeah i, I remember about a month after my book came out uh, someone tweeted me and said i i never ever thought that caffeine was a problem for me but i've i've read your book i've taken your recommendation I, i've how i now only have two cups of coffee and i have it before noon and i've never slept this well in over 30 years and it's just incredible how such a common thing that people are doing day to day may be impacting our sleep and I think you make a really good point that it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy the more caffeine you drink the more you need the more dependent you become the less good your sleep is and, and it just continues I think we also have to highlight we're talking about coffee but I think tea yeah. w- would be similar because it contains caffeine green tea you know a herbal tea that often people switch to when they're not having tea or coffee is also a highly caffeinated drink, so may affect you. You mentioned decaf coffee. You know, I've read some reports are saying that decaf coffee does contain some caffeine. Do you know much yeah. about that? So decaffeinated coffee is not no caffeinated coffee. <laughs> so you do have to be, uh, you know, somewhat mindful of that. Um, and they looked and you can sort of search around on the internet. There's some good sites that will describe exactly how much. Some brands have very little caffeine at all. Um, other brands, however, I was surprised to find can have up to 20 percent uh, caffeine in. So you have five cups of those, you know, and you're well on your way to a standard cup of coffee. So you do have to be a little bit careful. Um, but it's certainly a good way if you're thinking about trying to come off caffeine to sort of psychologically still treat yourself with that you exactly. know, pleasure. And, and it tastes um, great, right? Yeah, it does. <laughs> it, it really it, 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 it's not too bad. So caffeine is something that a lot of us do in the morning. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit later about alcohol, which is something that people often use in the early evening or late evening to help them unwind for bed. But you know, before we go deep into alcohol, because I think that's something that people are incredibly fascinated about, because I think that whole term of a nightcap, you know, people, <laughs> it's there in, in our vernacular now, how it's something that can help you just slip off into sleep. Or can it? We'll, we'll find out <laughs> shortly. But, um, you know, listeners to my podcast know that I, I talk about these four key pillars of health that I think have the most impact on the way that we feel, but also that we've got some degree of control over. Mm. Food and movement, which people have been talking about for years, but also sleep and relaxation. Now, in your book, right at the start, you make a very powerful case why sleep is the foundational pillar of health. I'd love you to talk more about that. Yeah, you know, I used to think that sleep may be the third pillar of good health alongside diet and exercise. But the more I sort of did my research and the more I read from other people, I realized I was probably wrong that in fact sleep is the foundation on which those two other things sit. Um, And I'll give you an example in each. Firstly, for diet and exercise, we know that if people are trying to lose weight and they're being judicious about their food intake, they're trying to um, diet, but they're not getting sufficient sleep, 70% of all the weight that they lose will come from lean muscle mass and not fat. Because your body becomes very stingy in giving up its fat when you are underslept. So dieting becomes, you know, quite redundant in that regard. You know, you, you want to keep the muscle, you want to let go of the fat and sleep 
deprivation will do the opposite to you. So that's the first thing. It's a foundational element on which, you know, nutrition sits. And by the way, I'd love to talk all about sort of diet, appetite, sort of increased caloric intake, increasing exactly what you desire to eat when you're underslept. There's great data there. But let me move over to activity. We've spoken about the foundation on which diet sits. When you are not sleeping sufficient amounts, firstly, the likelihood that you will actually exercise decreases significantly. Your motivation to be physically active drops away. Even if you are physically active, the intensity of your workout will not be as strong. So it's less effective and less efficient. Your things like your vertical jump height, your muscle contraction strength, even the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen in your respiratory systems, they get worse when you haven't slept. Wow. What's even more frightening, however, is that your risk for injury increases when you are exercising but not well slept. This is incredible. And they did a great study where they looked at um, some athletes across a season, and then they tracked their sleep. And then they bucketed those athletes into the different amounts of sleep, nine hours, eight hours, seven hours, six hours. What they found was a linear relationship between less and less sleep and increasing risk for serious injury during a sports event. So there is yet another demonstration of how even if you're trying to be physically active but not getting sufficient sleep, it can be harmful. The beauty of that part of the relationship and the same for diet is that it's bi-directional. That if you actually, you know, improve your sleep, you can improve those two things. But conversely, those two things will improve sleep. Yeah. So if you start to correct your diet, you start to sleep better. We've already spoken about caffeine. But physical activity is a great way to enhance both the quality and the quantity of your deep sleep. So physical activity, as long as it's not too close to bedtime, if it's too close, your metabolic rate stays too high, your core body temperature stays too high, and that will prevent sleep. I'm seeing that a lot as well, you know, and I've experienced that myself in terms of squash is one of my favorite games. Um, but if I play squash at about 7 or 7.30 p.m., I can't sleep that night. You know, I'm lying in bed at night. Um, I know it's about five-ish for me really is the last time I can go on the squash court, have a great workout, have an enjoyable game, and everything seems to have sort of gone back down to normal before I try and sleep at night. And I, I'm seeing that a lot with patients, which again, you know, if people are after work, they're trying to fit their workout in, you know, it becomes challenging because the modern world is making it sometimes quite tricky for us to live in harmony with our natural circadian rhythms. Yeah. But, but I see that a lot working out intensely in the evening is a problem. Have you done research on that in your lab? So we've looked at this with body temperature too, you know, and, and I understand that people, you know, I still want to celebrate and embrace the idea of people exercising. I of think course. that's critical. Um, and even if it's late into the night, best not to do that. But if you do do that, a good way um, to try and solve the higher core body temperature is to have a bath or a shower right before bed. And a hot bath, right? A hot bath yeah. is best, yeah, or a hot shower, because what happens is that all of the blood comes to the surface of your skin. You kind of get nice rosy cheeks. And that acts like this huge thermal radiator, taking all of the heat out of the core of your body. And as a consequence, the core body temperature will actually plummet and you will fall asleep easier. That's all, the reason that it's always easier to fall asleep in a room that's too cold than too hot. Too cold is taking you in the right temperature direction for good sleep. So if you do have to work out at some point late into the night, you can try that trick. But for the most part, try and get your workout in a little bit earlier. It's a great tip, though, for people, because I know there'll be many people listening to this who probably do try and get their workout in in the evening. So that's a great little tip that they can put into practice to see if, if they can, you know, ensure that that workout doesn't hinder their ability to get good sleep. As you were talking about vertical jump and, you know, you know, as a sportsman myself, I sort of, you know, this really, you know, gets me excited to think, actually, can you improve your performance by sleeping more? And immediately what came into my head is an interview. I think it was an interview or maybe I heard this comment. I mean, you may, uh, may know more, more about this, but I have heard that Roger Federer may get, I think he's been on record to say he gets 12 hours of sleep a night. I don't know if that's true or not. Have you, have you heard about that at all? Yeah, yeah. So he does. He gets about uh, 12 hours of sleep. And if you look at lots of sports athletes, um, you know, LeBron James, the basketball player, 
He suggests that he gets somewhere between 10 and 11 hours. He splits that. He has a nap routinely during the day of about an hour and logs about sort of nine to 10 hours at night. Um, Usain Bolt, you know, he is, um, he says he never gets anything less than nine hours. And I believe for one of his world records, um, he had only been awake for about uh, 35 minutes because he'd taken a nap oh, I love it. <laughs> right before, I think it was an Olympic gold and a world record that he broke. And uh, and he had only been awake for about 35 minutes because he'd slept. And, you know, this is what, you know, I do some consulting now for um, some uh, Premier League football teams as well as NBA, NFL in the United States because they're starting to to realize that sleep is probably the greatest legal performance enhancing drug that you could ever wish for. And it's not just in terms of preparation for exercise, by the way, for which it is spectacular. It's also about recovery. And that's one of the places where I see a lot of their sports physios perhaps um, not recognizing what they can do with sleep. Yeah. They l- front load it about before the game, which is great. But often when teams are playing, they're playing multiple games. It's about a season and it's all about maintaining their players' health. And that recovery period after a game before you play the next game is key. You know, players will dive into baths of ice to try and reduce swelling and inflammation. Sleep is a critical part of that sports equation need sleep on both sides of that so it's fascinating just uh, i say it just for people who are you know really interested in being physically active maintaining their peak performance make sure that you also consider sleep after being physically active as well when we talk about peak performance you know everyone's looking for peak performance these days of course those guys are athletes right so their idea of peak performance is probably you know when roger federer is playing in in a grand slam tennis match he wants to be operating at peak performance but you know, like, you know, Joe Public also wants peak performance in their lives. You know, they want to be able to wake up feeling refreshed, you know, maybe get their kids to school without there being a whole load of arguments at home because everyone's underslept and tired. They want to get to work and perform well in their job. So they feel that they're contributing to whatever work they're doing. They're operating at a high level. So, you know, what, I guess, You know, some people may think, yeah, Roger Federer, LeBron James, you know, yeah, sure, great for those guys. But, you know, I don't need as much sleep as them. So my question would be, what can we learn from those guys then in terms of how they prioritize sleep? How much sleep do we need every day? But also, in episode 14 of this this podcast, it was a few episodes ago, I interviewed uh, Nick Littlehales, um, who for you know many years has been advising clubs like Manchester United, uh, the England football team, and he talks about this idea of 90-minute sleep cycles. I don't know if you've read his book or you're familiar with, with yeah. his recommendation, yeah. but I find it, you know, he talks about this whole idea of five 90-minute cycles that we need throughout the day. And I know some people found that quite helpful to take the pressure off them at night. So quite a few questions there, Matt, but I wonder if we could try <laughs> yeah. and, just try and go into those those areas a little bit. Yeah, so right now the recommendation is for most adults get seven to nine hours of sleep. And to get, by the way, to get seven hours of sleep, you probably need at least a seven and a half hour sleep opportunity. I think that's what many people miss in recommendations from sort of experts. They say, get your seven hours of sleep. So people think that means, you know, well, if I go to bed at, you know, 11 p.m. and I wake up at 6 a.m., then I've got my seven hours of sleep. That's not true. You probably will have only logged about sort of six hours and 40 minutes, and, and that's that's not enough. So you need to think about the sleep opportunity time as being probably around about eight hours optimally. What we also know is that once you get below seven, we can start to measure objective impairments in your body and in your brain as well. The problem is that most people don't realize that they're sleep deprived when they're sleep deprived. This is a big problem with sleep loss. And, you know, the analogy, I guess, would be um, a drunk driver at a bar. You know, they've had a couple of pints, maybe a few shots. And they pick up their car keys and they say to you, you know, look, I'm fine to drive home. (laughs) And you say, no, I know that you think you're fine to drive home, but trust me, you're not. You are objectively, you're impaired. It's the same way with a lack of sleep that our subjective sense is a miserable predictor of objectively how well we're doing with a lack of sleep. And I think that's one of the um, one of the issues that um, I try to sort of help dismiss uh, in terms of a notion. I think the other thing that's problematic, too, about getting 
too little sleep is that your baseline level of how you think your health and your wellness is just becomes chronically low and you accept that as if that's just where I am in life. This is just me. This is as good as it can be. And people don't realize that if you were to change something like sleep or stress or diet or physical activity, there's actually a better form of you waiting on the other side of those yeah, things. Absolutely. It just requires perhaps, you know, some knowledge and an invitation to go there. Matthew, I, I call this podcast Feel Better, Live More for a reason. And it really just echoes what you what you just said then. You know, when we feel better by, you know, prioritizing sleep, by, you know, looking at these other pillars that I talk about, we get more out of life. We're we're a better version of ourselves. We have better relationships. We have you know, much deeper, more meaningful interactions with the world around us when we're feeling better. And I guess you would argue that when we sleep better, we live more. We do. I mean, firstly, that data is very clear that um, if you look across epidemiological studies, millions of individuals in these studies, a very simple truth comes out, which is that the shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. That short sleep predicts all-cause mortality. Wow. And so, you know, I think... I think we just need to stop and just let, let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> a little... Depriving ourselves from sleep will shorten our life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the, the powerful data that, you know, the global sleep loss epidemic that is underway right now, which I believe is probably one of the greatest public health challenges that we now face um, in the 21st century, it is a slow form of self euthanasia. It's a very powerful statement, one that I absolutely would agree with. Um, have we as a society, I don't know if overprioritize is the right words, but um, yeah, let's go with overprioritize. Have we, let, have we put too much focus on the right food and the right physical activity at the expense of sleep? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I've thought about this a lot. Um, I, I don't think we've done it at the expense of sleep perhaps, but I do resonate with your comment that I think sleep has perhaps been the neglected stepsister in the health conversation of today. And I think it's been left out in the cold. There's a, probably a number of reasons for that. The first is just because scientists like me are to blame. What I mean is that we have not adequately communicated to the public or to medicine or to healthcare professionals in general how critical the importance and necessity of sleep is. You know, and I liken where we are with sleep with where we were um, for smoking 50 years ago. You know, all of the science was there, but it hadn't trickled down yeah. into the public knowledge base or even into medicine. Well, that's what you do so great with your book is you're, you're bringing that awareness to the general public all over the world, which is fantastic. And that was part of the motivation for the book. You know, I could see the disease and sickness and ill health that was caused by insufficient sleep. And there wasn't, you know... Um, there wasn't a blueprint guide. There wasn't some kind of a, a manifesto for sleep. And so that was part of the reason to write the book. But I think to come back, um, you know, to why sleep has been left out in the cold, I think part of it is people like, you know, well, at least my fault. Um, I think the other thing too is that unlike diet and exercise, sleep has an image problem. You know, I think... Nobody feels ashamed about saying, I went out for a run at lunchtime or, you know, I, I went, I had a great run this morning. Nobody necessarily feels ashamed about, you know, putting salad on their plate, you know, and making a really healthy meal. But I do think people feel sometimes ashamed by saying, well, I, I need at least eight and a half hours of sleep a night, you know, and sometimes I've heard the reaction of people saying, Really? And that really has a hint in it to suggest that if you're getting sufficient sleep, and I choose that word carefully, sufficient, then you must be lazy, that you're slothful. Yeah. Because we've tagged and we've associated this thing called necessary sleep with that luggage of, you know, something to be ashamed about. And in fact, if anything, it's what happens is that people have this braggadocio attitude, this almost sort of sleep machismo attitude that you're very proud to tell people how little sleep that you're getting as though it's, you know, a badge of honor. I see that in some people, not all, not all people, but some people. So I think to change that part of the sleep discussion and bring it into the health equation, we need to destigmatize sleep 
uh, in a way too. I think those are at least two of the reasons why it's been left out in the cold. Alarm clocks stop the single most important behavioural experience we have. Yeah, and that's sleep, of course. And and we've we've so undervalued sleep. You know, we, we, it's been treated as almost an illness that needs a cure or an indulgence. And of course, in the 80s, those of us that remember the 80s, um, you know, people used to come and say, oh, I've done an all, another all-nighter. And then people used to clap them on the back. And in fact... You don't want people like that in the workplace. I mean, essentially, what we've discovered over the past sort of 20 years or so is that sleep consolidates our memory, but it's not just the retention of facts. We're actually problem-solving. So if you want to come up with innovative solutions to complex problems, a night of sleep achieves that. We're also discovering that... uh, the, the, the elimination of, of, of beta amyloid, this, this misfolded protein that's been associated with dementia, is packaged up and got rid of whilst we sleep. So much of the stuff going on within the brain and the body whilst we sleep defines our ability to function during the day. And, you know, it's, it's really, we've got to start embracing sleep. You know, as I, as I read through your book, and as I think about the literature, the work you're putting out there, I think about the impact that sleep deprivation has on our entire physiology. You know, this idea that's been sitting with me the last few days is that, number one, a lot of us don't realise how sleep deprived we are. And I think in many ways, the way we experience the world is influenced by our levels of sleep. Yeah, I think... That's, you know, during the research for for the book, the realisation that the tired brain remembers negative experiences but forgets the positive ones. So tired individuals' entire world view is influenced by by a negative salience. You know, we're making decisions, remembering the negative stuff and not the positive stuff. Um, that's just one example, I think. Yeah, That's really profound, Russell, because if, if as a doctor I, I look around and I see... How many problems we have these days with excessive negative thoughts that people struggle with? Yeah. And then if you look at the data in terms of how sleep deprived we are, potentially this is the smoking gun that's sitting there that if all of us start to pay a little bit more attention to, perhaps that would have a profound impact on the way we feel and as you say, these negative thoughts. And across the whole demographic, from, from youngsters uh, and young youngsters, all the way through to the, to the elderly. Uh, it, I think it could make a, a huge difference. Yeah. So we're recording this uh, late morning. Uh, it is just past midday. So I know from your book now that we've just passed the danger zone, the most dangerous part of the day, right? So I feel Absolutely. good that we should celebrate with a glass. Phew, yeah. It's 12.01. <laughs> so can you explain a little bit about what is so dangerous about mornings and in particular this 6 a.m. to 12 p.m. time period? Yeah, but, well, well, the, the biggie, of course, is stroke and heart attacks. Between 6 a.m. and 12 noon, there's almost a 50% greater chance of having a stroke or a heart attack. Wow. And of course, it represents the sort of the biological switch from the sleep resting state to the active state. So, so what our internal clocks are doing is anticipating increased activity. So even before we wake, blood pressure is going up, the mobilization of glucose is going up. Um, interestingly, the, the stickiness of platelets is going up, presumably anticipating an increased risk of, of damage and therefore the need to clot. Uh, and and some so cortisol is all, all going up, mobilizing our bodies for activity. Now, if you're healthy, it's not an issue. In fact, it's a, it's a wonderful adaptive response. So you can get out into the new environment and exploit it to the full. But if you have health problems, then that surge in blood pressure, that increased stickiness of the blood mm. is going to predispose to things like heart attack and stroke. And and what's become very clear is that when you take your anti-stroke medication, your antihypertensives, really matters. So, for example, <clears throat> taking them before you go to sleep, before bedtime, rather than first thing in the morning, over a sort of uh, four or five year window, uh, can actually halve your chances of having a stroke or a heart attack. Now, that information isn't widely known. And, and I think we've got to try and get this sort of, this, this, this sort of knowledge more widely accepted. Yeah, a couple of things came up for me there, Russell. I remember, I'm going to guess, seven or eight years ago, uh, I was getting quite frustrated as a medical doctor with 
my lack of awareness over all kinds of things to do with our lifestyle and how it influences health. And I was yeah. thinking, if I knew a bit more about this and how to manipulate it, I'm sure I could help my patients yeah. more. Mm -hmm. So I would go in my holidays around the world to various conferences. And I remember in America sitting at a conference and there was a cardiologist called Dr. Mark Houston. I remember him saying exactly this to me. Years ago, he was saying something like, most blood pressure medications should be taken in the evening. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, we're giving them all that in the morning. Yeah. And people are just taking them in the morning because it's easy. It's with breakfast, I'll just yeah. take it. So I think that was the first time that that lodged in my head that, yeah. oh, the timing of these medications is important. The other thing, Russell, that came up for me as you were speaking there, on the show, we've spoken a lot about stress in the past. And what happens when the stress response gets activated? Yeah. And what you just described happening then in the early hours, just before we wake up, those are the those are the things of the stress response. Blood being more prone to clotting, blood pressure going up, cortisol going up. So it's almost like a mini stress response first thing in the morning. It, indeed, it is. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, stress gets a bad rap. I mean, you know, it's it's a, it's a shame. I mean, I, I liken stress. Um, as the sort of the first gear in, 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 in a car. You know, it gives you that wonderful acceleration. So it's great, you know. Um, but if you keep the engine in first gear, of course, you'll destroy it. And, and that's the problem with so much of our stress these days. It's not that it's an acute, quick shift. We're, for example, night shift workers, they're running on stress to keep awake and to keep functional during the night shift. And so no wonder there's all those health problems associated with that group. Yeah. You mentioned the clock, and there's there's a lot in your book about our body clock, our body clocks, I yeah. should say, yeah, and yeah. what they all do, what influences them. One thing I've felt and experienced when people, when my patients, when members of the public are thinking about sleep, they're often thinking about the evening. They're thinking about what do I do just before bed? What yes. do I do in those hours? preceding me going to my bedroom. And of course, that's important. We're definitely going to yep. get to that. But I thought it would be useful, particularly through the lens of the clock, I guess, talk about the morning. Why is what we do first thing in the morning so important for our ability to sleep at night? Yeah. So we have this this circadian system, this sort of internal representation of a, a biological day. And what it does is anticipate the very demands of the rest activity, the sleep-wake cycle. Now, for it to be of any use, the internal day needs to be set to the real day, the astronomical day. And the classic mismatch between biological time and environmental time is jet lag. And we eventually get over jet lag as a result of exposure to the, the light-dark cycle in the new time zone. But what we require in any time zone is daily exposure to the light-dark cycle, and particularly morning light for 90% of us. Most of us have either a long body clock or a body clock that's slightly longer. And so it will naturally drift a little bit later and later and later each day. And the effects of light are not the same. Morning light advances the clock, makes, it, makes us get up earlier and go to bed earlier, whereas dusk light delays the clock. It makes us go to bed later and get up later. And so what morning light does to us is take this drifting clock and shoves it forward a bit in time so it's beautifully aligned. Now, of course, this is important at every level. I mean, we did a study a few years ago on, on teenagers and we found that, and, and all over the world, um, and found that the later the chronotype, the eveningness versus morningness, uh, the greater the evening light these young people got. So they were getting up after morning. Um, so not getting the morning light, which would advance the clock, but they were getting evening light, which would delay the clock. So part of their, their going to bed late and getting up late is when they were actually seeing light. And so morning light for most of us is really important to set the biological clock, which then aligns all of our activity, including the sleep-wake cycle, to the appropriate time of day. Yeah, so this is fascinating. There's so much there. So we live according to 24-hour days. Yeah. Okay. But one thing I'm aware of from your book and other research is that our internal clocks are not set to exactly 24 hours. So exactly. I want to I talk about that and why you think that might be, because we certainly, I guess, didn't evolve for 
plane travel in the future. Uh, you know, do you know what <laughs> no, I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. so, so when we go on a twelve-hour flight to LA from London, yeah. we could adapt straight away, right? So that presumably wasn't evolution's goal. So I'm interested as to why it's not twenty-four hours in mm. your view, but also you say morning light. So does it matter what time? off morning light that is, you know, can people get it at lunchtime? Are we talking as soon as people wake up? And of course that changes in the seasons, yes. right? So can you help us put okay. all those things together? Okay, so why isn't the human body clock exactly 24 hours? Well, now here's some hand waving because the, the modelers say that if you want two oscillators to align to each other, two rhythms, one is fixed, obviously the, the rotation of the earth is fractionally under 24 hours. And if you want to fit a, a body clock to that, it helps if it's slightly different from 24 hours, because then it can a, a align more easily. Now, I don't pretend to understand the mathematics <laughs> behind it, but that's why, why it is. But there's, a, there's an even... So Mother Nature knew what she was doing. She, of is course, what as always. <laughs> I mean, but the really interesting question, I think, for me is, why is there such diversity in the human chronotype. So, the, you know, the fact that we have some people, you know, are really early larks and some people really late owls. There's a huge diversity, you know, to the extent that you can almost bed share in some extremes. Whereas if you look at the mice or any other animal you want to study, it's all very, very similar. And I think this is something that, that's puzzled me for ages. And it may well be that in our society, you know, and we've, we've only moved very rapidly from sort of essentially small groups, tribes, interacting, <clears throat> it may have been useful under those circumstances to have vigilance across the 24-hour mm. day and having some people that were sort of awake early um, and could perhaps alert the group that there was danger from another tribe, for example, or, or, or some sort of animal. And that may be why we've retained this extraordinary diversity. It's very, yeah. We're very weird as a species in that regard. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? You mentioned the word chronotype. Yeah. I wonder if you could just elaborates exactly what does chronotype mean. And then you also mentioned owls and larks. And I'm really interested in this because, A, me and my wife appear to have slightly different body clocks. But many people I feel, certainly if I look at my clinical experience, Russell, and this also, I think, speaks to this idea that the body clock isn't quite 24 hours, that we can manipulate it depending on what we need it to do or what the tribe needs or what the weather is, right? A lot of the time I think, well, are we evening types really evening types or are they evening types because of the modern light environment? Yes. Um, so yeah, quite a lot there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so what defines your chronotype, whether you're a morning person or an evening person? And there are a number of factors. The first of all is one's genetics. We now know that the clock genes and the proteins that they make, subtle changes, subtle polymorphisms in those genes are associated with morningness and eveningness. So by their contribution to our genes, our parents are still telling us what time to get up and go to bed <laughs> at, at some level. So that's the first thing. Through development, our chronotype changes. So from about the age of 10, we want to start to go to bed a bit later and a bit later. Our lateness peaks in males at around about 21, 21 and a half, in females about 19, 19 and a half. And males peak later, uh, or they have a later chronotype than females. Then from those late teens, early 20s, we start to move to a more morning chronotype. So by the time we're in our late 50s, early 60s, we're getting up and going to bed on average when we got up and went to bed when we were 10. And that sort of basically maps the changes in some of the sex steroids, testosterone and estrogen. So it's thought that there's a, a very important hormonal mod modification of, 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 of the clock. So that's within individuals. We've that's all within got individuals. like, so whatever I'm born with, let's say I was born a morning type, and I think I'm a morning type, then when I'm 10, in my teenage years, that's going to be pushed, it's going to be later and later. Yeah. As you say, for most males, a peak at 21 and then it's going to start going back again. But what about 
between individuals. There's variation huge, there as well, huge, right? Uh, yeah, uh, a huge in- individual variation. I think that's a really important point because, you know, in terms of our sleep weight patterns and um, our chronotype, there's massive individual variation. And, and you know, um, <clears throat> it, there's a, on average about a two hour difference from somebody in their, from the, in their late 50s, early, uh, uh, early 60s uh, to somebody in their late teens. So asking a, a teenager to get up at seven o'clock in the morning is like asking a a 60-year-old to get up at five o'clock in the morning. Now, does that matter? I guess there's a real interest here for me, given that my son's 12 and about to enter uh, these teenage years. Yes. And as a family, we prioritise sleep, or we certainly have done, but I'm I'm already noticing with him a change in terms of his desire to do what he has done in the past. Let's put it like that. Okay. Yeah, test, I think they call it testosterone poisoning, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> and what I'm interested in is when we say teenagers want to go to bed later and wake up later and we think about their chronotype, what if that teenager still went to bed early? So mm. what's driving the change? Is it the fact that they're going to bed late, therefore they're having to stay in bed later? Like, could that be environmental, school pressure, that sort of stuff? Or do, yeah. do you know what I'm getting yeah, at? Absolutely. Well, well, of course, the the other factor, the sort of, as it were, the 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 biological factor, would be when you see light, as we as we d- just discussed, sort of morning light advances the clock, evening light delays the clock, and teenagers, particularly over the weekend, will miss the morning light, making them get up earlier, but they get the evening light, so they're or the afternoon evening light, and so they'll go to bed later. So those are the three sort of biological uh, factors. But then we have to add a couple of other things. One is, of course, the use of social media. Uh, It's very interesting. Many teenagers appreciate that they shouldn't be using social media into the early hours of the morning, uh, but they feel uh, that sense of being connected to their group over overrides that knowledge about why it's important to be asleep. So there's that element. And in fact, it's really fascinating. Some studies have shown that that lateness can be hugely late. So what happens, of course, is that they have very shortened sleep. Mm. They're driven out of bed by an alarm clock or a parent. They struggle through the school day. Often, and when you you talk to many teachers, kids are actually falling asleep at the desks. So then they finish school and then they have not just a short nap, but it can be a nap of two hours or so, Mm. which then pushes back the pressure to sleep that night. And so, so, you know, the the, the desire to use social media and the fact that they're not as tired because they had to sleep in the late afternoon means that they can function later um, uh, at night and they get that shortened sleep. And in fact, you have to be very careful because it can lead to increasingly shortened sleep at night and longer naps after school, which, you know, and you can fall into this sort of feedback loop of really disrupting the sleep. If that teenager could go to sleep, let's say, on time, at a more suitable time, given what time they have to get up for school or the school bus or whatever, the the sort of fixing that they can't move, does the later chronotype still matter i.e. if they shift their environment. So actually, I'm still going to, I'm going to go to bed earlier. I'm not going to expose myself to evening light. But this may sound hi- <laughs> optimal and hypothetical as <laughs> something that's practically impossible. But yeah. in theory, would that then normalise things, do you think? Yeah, you can shift teenagers to an earlier chronotype because of light exposure, absolutely. Uh, it practically, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, but it's, it, it's in theory yeah. possible, yeah. And, and this light exposure, whereas in the morning it advances the clock and in the evening it delays the clock, so pushes it back. What light exposure are we talking about here? Because let's say in the evening or at dusk you saw natural lights, not artificial lights. Yeah. Does that still do the same thing at pushing it back? Or does that have a different wavelength that doesn't affect us in the same way? Well, you, you're, you're sort of impinging upon what I've, I've sort of been working on for a long time, which is how does how does light interact with the body clock? And the first sort of extraordinary finding was that the visual cells within the eye, the rods and the cones, are not 
required to detect that dawn mm -hmm. dusk cycle. There's a third photoreceptor within the eye. And 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 those, and we've been working out most recently how those receptors interact with this sort of master clock within the brain. So that's one thing. The second thing is that these photoreceptors need quite a bit of light. So we don't really appreciate because our visual system is so good, but we live our lives in dim, dark caves. So uh, shortly after dawn, um, natural light is some 50 to 100 times brighter than average domestic light conditions. Um, and, and so really what the clock is looking for is a bright light signal. And so we're talking in the hundreds to thousands of lux range. So if you think of, of natural light, okay, moonlight would be 0 0.01 lux. Um, and a bright sunny day, even in, the, even in the UK, can just about get up to 100,000 lux. Mm. And those those weird, amazing photoreceptors need, as I say, this sort of 100 to 1,000 lux range. Now, it's complicated because it depends upon how long you're exposed to that light. So you can compensate to some extent for a lower light intensity by increasing the duration. And it's worth bearing in mind, until the late 80s, it was thought that the human circadian clock was not regulated by light at all. Uh, because when people use sort of relatively low levels of light that would shift the biological clock or entrain the biological clock of a mouse, it had no effect at all. But this is in humans. the 1980s, right? Yeah, the late, yeah the I read 1980s. that this morning in your book, and, and that shocked me because 1987, right? Yeah. I was just finishing primary school. It does not... Maybe it is, but it doesn't seem that long ago to me. And I thought, when I read that, I, I had to reread it. This idea that back then, which wasn't that long ago, we didn't think light hugely influenced our circadian rhythm. And now that's considered fact. And I think, well, what else is going on oh, that we oh, don't know at the moment? Well, that's what's so exciting about this field. But I, I remember, you know, doing, doing my, my PhD. Um, and I, I got my PhD in, in, in 84. And... Uh, you know, when you did public talks or anything, people say, well, well how is it regulated? And so it's primarily social cues and food. And I remember being actually at that first presentation in, in 1987. And, you know, it was an audible gasp around me. Oh, my God, you know, you just need a lot of light. And of course, now we know light is incredibly important for the regulation of human circadian rhythms, but you need quite a bit of it. And this is where we fall into some problems because there's a lot of stuff out there saying <clears throat> you shouldn't look at a, at a Kindle immediately before you go to bed because it'll shift the biological clock. So the most detailed study, which was from a group at Harvard, asked people to look at a, a Kindle on its brightest intensity four hours before bedtime. And they asked them to do this on five consecutive nights. And after that, on the, on the fifth day, uh, sleep was delayed by an average of 10 minutes. And it was just statistical. And as one of my colleagues said, um, well, it may be statistically significant, but it's biologically meaningless. Wow. And so... But <clears throat> we do know that light in the evening can delay the clock. But how much and what intensity and for how long is still being resolved? Clearly, the brighter the light and the longer you see it before bedtime could shift the clock. But what we do know that light is doing is increasing alertness and therefore delaying sleep onset. So it's probably not the light from the devices changing the clock, but it's the light from the devices changing alertness and therefore delaying sleep. Yeah, super, super interesting. So if we just stick to what that study showed, that was on a Kindle. I know when I've heard you speak before that you regard kindles as quite different from smartphones or looking at social media perhaps you could explain why that is well because a kindle is 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 fairly you know you're just reading it basically whereas a smartphone you're checking your emails you're looking at social media you're checking the news you might even be listening to music at the same time and so these are really interactive devices and they will be increasing alertness and therefore delaying sleep onset yeah super interesting in terms of light just to finish off in the evening then, we're talking about the complexities of light, you know, how much, how long for, all these kinds of things. Some people who are promoting health and well-being are talking about the importance of morning light, morning natural light. I know there's one neuroscientist in America who talks about getting 10 to 30 minutes, if you can, yeah. within half an hour of waking up. Okay, so that's 
very clear guidance. I want to I want to know your view on that. The data are good for that. I mean, really, really. I mean, so for example, the the Ken Wright studies have shown beautifully that bright morning light, real light, not artificial light, can advance the clock and, ha- and, and really shift individuals you know, two hours earlier. So there's, there's no question about it. And you can mimic this in, in the lab as well. So for example, 10,000 lux for 30 minutes uh, from a light box will also set the clock. So, so the data are there pretty solid. Then we say advance the clock. What if someone doesn't want to advance their clock and they uh, wake yeah. up and they're like, you know what? I've got a a late work night out tonight and I won't be back for my normal time. And I've never thought of this question before, but I'm just intrigued. Might one then think, hey, for tonight, I'm actually going to not expose myself to light for a couple of hours because I want to delay that? Or is that hard to say? It it, it, it probably will have a small effect. (laughs) I mean, the the tricky thing is for those 10% of individuals who are really morning types. And and, and it's it's a shame, really, because most of their their colleagues will be intermediate to late types. And of course, they will be then forced on a Friday and a Saturday evening to stay up way beyond where they want to be. And they sort of complain bitterly that, um, you know, God, all my friends said they want me to stay up. Of course, for the work environment, environment, it's great. They yeah. can get up, you know, go to the gym early and then go on to work. Whereas most of us who are late types find that a struggle. So you're happy with that 10 to 30 minutes natural light recommendation? Would yes. you would you would you ideally have people do that as soon as they can after yes. waking? Certainly the, 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 the earlier the bigger the the effect, yes. And, and it's and it's very important um, ac- across the spectrum. So, for example, in the nursing home environment, up until fairly recently, the light in those uh, nursing homes was really low. I mean, terribly low. Some cases in the television room, it would be just sort of 10, 20 lux. I mean, crazy low. Uh, now people are realizing that if you increase the light in the day spaces, then you can actually improve the sleep-wake behavior of, of, of individuals in a nursing home. And where it's been looked at in individuals are showing mild dementia, you could actually improve cognition wow. by 10% simply by increasing the light with inside and, and also using other tricks like you know having breakfast by a window where there's a lot of light coming through. Wow, that's fascinating. And then in terms of evening, I want to draw a distinction between natural light and artificial light. So let's say you live in a country where you have long light evenings at particular times of the year, like the UK, for example. You want to get your morning light in the morning, which is clearly a lot easier in a UK summer than it is in the winter. What happens if you want to be outside in the evening? So it's, it's still natural. It's not your screen. It's not social media. It's not the news. It's not all that attention stimulating information. Mm. Is there something going on in natural light where actually you know, the evening light perhaps doesn't shift the clock as much or, 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 or does that still do it? Well, of course, when we're all agricultural workers, we got symmetrical exposure to dawn and dusk. Yeah. And so, you know, the morning light would advance us, but then that was counteracted by the, the dusk light, which would delay us. And so it, so it was fine. And the problem that many of us face now is that we get asymmetrical exposure to the dawn-dusk cycle, which invariably means most of us will miss morning, but get lots of, of dusk light, uh, and therefore get up later. We'll de- delay the clock. Now, in terms of the quality, we've, we've talked about the intensity, we've talked about the duration, um, but we should also touch about the colour, the wavelength of light. Now, those specialised photoreceptors are maximally sensitive in the blue part of the spectrum. In fact, intriguingly, if you look at the blue of a really beautiful blue sky, that's where they're maximally sensitive. Um, so, So there's been a suggestion that actually only blue light is important. But again, it's more complicated than that because the response is like a bell-shaped curve. It's maximally sensitive in in, in the blue, but of course it it doesn't mean that they won't the receptors won't detect shorter uh, wavelength right. uh, or indeed longer wavelength light. Again, it's how long you're exposed to it. We also now know, which is turned out to be really confusing, that the rods and cones which we know are not required for the regulation of the clock, talk to those specialised photoreceptors so they can modulate their activity. 
Some of them, some of the rods and cones seem to add sensitivity and others seem to inhibit the responses. So it's turning out to be really complicated yeah. um, and we don't fully understand why. So the best advice would be, let's say someone is trying to get on top of their circadian rhythm and their sleep and they feel either for work reasons or for other reasons they're going to bed too late. The best advice at the moment would be to try and limit light exposure in the evening, even if it's natural light, you still want to be a bit careful. Yeah. And and if you are an extreme late type and you really are struggling, then what you need to do is um, set the alarm and either get outside first thing in the morning or get a light box, which will advance the clock and make it easier for you to get up for job or, or whatever reason. Yeah. yeah. I know you were on uh, the Chris Evans Breakfast Show recently talking about your book and um, I remember in that conversation, Chris said, because he, for many years, is you know, presenting on live radio, I think at the moment at 6.30 a.m. And I think he said to you that he goes to bed at 7 p.m. or he at least puts an eye mask on at 7 p.m. So it's reducing how much light is coming through his eyes. I think he said in that conversation with you, it had yeah. a massive difference. And then when he wakes up at 4 a.m., he puts all the lights on in his bedroom as bright as possible. Yeah. And that's really interesting. And, and I know he was saying it's had a huge difference for him. And of course, it, it maps onto exactly what we know about the system. He's doing exactly the right thing for what his requirements are, which is to get up early and then perform early. Yeah. And this is where I feel it's very empowering for people, even if they were to find out their chronotype and then to find out that, man, my job is actually in disharmony with my natural chronotype, mm. you can do things, can't you, to yes. manipulate it so you're maybe not as vulnerable as you might have been. That's right. And, and I, I think we tend to feel as though our body clock is this fixed thing, just like our sleep-wake cycle. And it's not. It's dynamic and influenced by a whole range of different factors that can be tweaked to our advantage. Yeah. So interesting. You know, Russell, one of the things that's helped my sleep a lot over the past years, quite a few things we sleep. One is to avoid any sort of emotional stimulation in the evening. Yeah. So I've, this has probably been going for six or seven years now, I've had to educate the people around me, particularly my family, yeah. that I, I, I go to bed early, I wake up early, I just, it suits me. I don't know if I am actually a morning type. I certainly live like a morning type, but then I set everything up around that because... Ever since my kids were born, they've always got up really early. And I know for me, I'm a much better human being when I've had time for myself in the morning before anyone else is there. So I would shift it back so that I could have an hour to myself before they wake up. So I'm I'm now in a position where I usually go to bed by nine o'clock at the latest and I'm up by 5 a.m. at the latest. When I can stick to that consistently... I feel fantastic. Yeah, and that's exactly what we should all be doing. We should be defining, you know, what, what our biological needs are and also, of course, what our social needs are, or societal needs are, and particularly our work, and try and tune uh, ourselves accordingly. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it's so important. Yeah, and so that, that process required me to help people around me understand that, look, after seven, half seven, I really do not want to be contacted with anything unless it's an emergency. <laughs> I know. And, and of course, it's very difficult because, of course, um, towards bedtime is the only time when many couples get chance to talk about stuff. Yeah. But of course, it can be charged. And so, so, for example, I have banned any discussion of family finances before we go to bed or anything like that. You have to carve out time at a, <laughs> at a yeah. different time. The other thing that's interesting about your earlier bedtimes, of course, is you'll be eating much earlier. Yeah. And that can be very important. I mean, the, the data now are very clear that trying to concentrate one's calorie intake during breakfast and lunchtime and a very light supper or an earlier supper that, that you can possibly manage um, is better for our metabolic health and reduces the chances of weight gain, uh, uh, obesity and, and type 2 diabetes. So, so you, you have a, a double advantage there by going to bed earlier. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. So I think that's a really important point and that really speaks, I think, to this wider issue, which is a lot of the things that we would optimally do to optimise our circadian rhythms, optimise our sleep, optimise all these different functions in, in our bodies sometimes have to be done 
in conflict with what society yeah. is driving us to. And I think there's a much wider piece there. Just to finish off on light, at least for the for the moment, because I think it will keep coming back and it's so yeah. important. One of the things that has really helped me over the last years is, you know, I, I try my best not to be on my screen before bed. Uh, usually I'm good with that, although I'm human and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I fall prey to the temptation like anyone else might do. I try and read before bed. Mm -hmm. And in my bedside lamp, I've now changed maybe for a couple of years, maybe not even quite that long, but certainly recently, I put these low lux bulbs in. So I've got yep. this like amber low lux bulb. Now, I really feel it's made a massive difference the way I feel. It just feels softer. And whenever, if I'm in another room or staying somewhere where they've got a usual bulb, and I think, wow, this is quite obnoxiously bright. So are these things helpful in your view? They are indeed. Um, it, it sort of maps on, again, to the to the biology. This is what you, you'd certainly recommend um, because the lower the light, uh, you'll reduce uh, alertness and it'll be easier to get to sleep. And, of course, if it's bright light, then, of, of course, you, you will shift the clock. But, but um, you know, most, most artificial light is not going to have much of an effect. Uh, but the other thing, of course, is that what you're doing is defining the sleeping space. Um, and so, for example, you know, we've, we need to sort of reinforce the fact that the bedroom or the sleeping space is what you do when you want to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, have a, a lovely mattress, you have great pillows, you, you might even have a distinctive smell like lavender or something mm -hmm. else because you associate that distinctive smell with the sleep state. And I know people who, when they go and they, they travel and they're staying in a hotel room, they'll take a partner's perfume or aftershave mm. because that defines the sleeping space for them. So the extent to which those are almost placebo effects, it doesn't matter. If they work, then it, it, you should embrace them. When it comes to blue light blocking glasses, yeah. I'm interested what your views are. Before you answer that, I will say as a clinician, what I have found is for some people, they appear to have been transformative. Mm -hmm. Now, what does the science say? What is your view based upon all your years of research? Yeah, I mean, I mean, blue light blocking glasses were sort of originally introduced because it was thought that blue light would promote age-related macular degeneration. And the evidence for that is a bit mixed. Certainly, you'll get more damage with blue light in uh, a laboratory setting. So sort of if you expose cells to, to, to blue light, there's a greater chance of, of those cells um, undergoing apoptosis, They're, you know, th those cells dying, as it were. But when that's translated to the natural realm, it's not clear that blue light is having um, uh, much of a, uh, an effect on age-related macular degeneration. This has also been studied in the context of, of um, cataracts. So, for example, uh, blue-blocking lenses have, have been introduced to reduce uh, the blue light getting in and therefore age-related macular degeneration. The evidence for that um, is not great. There was a lot of concern that these blue blocking lenses are also going to disrupt the clock because after all the clock is maximally sensitive to blue light. Uh, we've done some studies showing that it doesn't matter whether you use a blue blocking or a UV blocking. Mm. Uh, you, it, it doesn't. And in fact, it's quite interesting. Most artificial lenses allow less blue light through than a natural lens. So we would be naturally exposed to more blue light anyway. So uh, I don't. I, I think that's where the sort of the origins of these 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 lens these blue blocking um, glasses and things are used. Now in in terms of the circadian system and the arousal systems, we do know that blue light is the most effective wavelength, and Christian Kjochen has done this from Switzerland, in uh, increasing alertness. So if you want to reduce alertness in the evening, it's likely that a blue blocking uh, set of glasses will be useful. Will it be useful in terms of the clock? Well, possibly. Mm. Um, but it depends, again, how long, how bright the, the environmental light is. A lot of people, of course, will ask me, well, so how much sleep do you get? And I will tell them that I do honestly get a non-negotiable eight-hour sleep opportunity every night. And it's n I'm not trying to be, you know, a poster child for sleep. I'm not trying to just sort of promote the book. 
if you knew the data as I do, and as I hope people um, will after reading the book, honestly, you just would not choose to do anything else. And, you know, I don't want to live a shorter life and I don't want to live a shorter life that is filled with with disease or sickness. And from everything I can tell, sleep is perhaps one of the most democratic, freely available, efficacious forms of um, of health insurance that you could ever wish for. And as a consequence, the reason I get that much is because for selfish reasons, you know, I just want to be alive and well for as long as possible. And I think, you know, it's interesting hearing you say why you prioritize it. You know, again, it's selfish is the wrong word, but it's for self-preservation reasons. Um, and one of the things I actually, if I, if you don't mind, I know you, this is your podcast and you're interviewing hey, me, but talk about whatever but, you want. But but I, I, but I would love to just ask you the question because you know when I saw the title of of the book, you know, and I saw that you know there on the front cover was this word called sleep, and it was on, part, on my book on your on the yeah, on the front cover of your book. Yeah. There was this thing called sleep: relax, eat, move, and sleep. And I well imagine that the first three would be there, of course, from you know an eminent clinician but i was surprised by the fall i was lovely excited it was wonderful (laughs) but tell me you know where did that decision come from to include sleep you know where did you get the awareness from where did you get the sensitivity to sleep you know was it boots on the ground with patients was it in a medical curriculum was it personal tell me i'd love to know yeah i think matthew that's a, a great question really i mean my i guess my journey into this um, of, of really being keen to promote lifestyle comes from a, you know, a, a real feeling that in medicine we've lost our way a little bit. Now we're not putting blame on anyone, yeah, um, yeah. but I, but I sort of feel that the medical system is set up around acute diseases, acute problems that respond very well to our magic bullet pharmaceutical interventions. But I think the health landscape, even in my career, and I've nearly been seeing patients now for about twenty years. Even in my career, I have seen the health landscape of the patients that that I see change dramatically. Whereas now, the bulk of what I see in my daily practice, you know, I say eighty percent of it is in some way driven by our collective modern lifestyles. Mm. And so, I've been delving deep for a few years now in terms of, you know, what are those lifestyle factors that I can leverage with my patients to get a better outcome. And of course, when I first started going on this journey, it was all about food, right? You know, it's like, okay, you know, it's all about diet. You know, and if we were having this chat five or six years ago, I would be saying, you know, most of what happens to us, you know, most of our health determinant is is basically foods. But I disagree now, you know, because I think when you know the science, when you have seen the science, um, as you detail so beautifully in your book, the, the case is compelling. You can't really ignore sleep. So. I'm a doctor who wants to get my patients better like every other doctor. I want to do this in as harmless a way as possible. And I also get very tired of suppressing downstream symptoms. So I want to go upstream as far as possible, see what lever can I turn that's going to have all these downstream consequences. And food is one of those things that, you know, food isn't just calories, you know, it's not just fat and carbs, it's information. It changes our genetic expression. So it's information for the body. In a similar way, physical activity can change hormones, can change genetic expression, all these kind of things. And, you know, so obviously um, that's food, that's movement. Relaxation is a whole piece about stress, you know, which, you know, some research is showing that up to 90% of what we see in primary care may have stress as a factor, which is incredible. And but I always felt I was missing one piece off the puzzle. And, you know, I would see, like, like if we take autoimmune disease for, for an, as, as an example, when I see my patients, I often do what's called a timeline. And I look, you know, I say, okay, you've got symptoms here today, but let's look at your whole life. Let's see what's been happening sequentially. Because I don't think a lot of these chronic conditions just happen overnight. There's been a buildup for a period of time, for a period of years. And I would often see with autoimmune conditions that you know, just a few months, sometimes just one month before the onset of symptoms, I would see either, either, you know, well, not either, I would often see a really stressful episode happen that would reduce the quality of people's sleep. And then I see symptoms come on. Yeah. 
There was a doctor I always want to learn from my patients. So, you know, your question is, where does this come from? Well, primarily it's come from listening to my patients and listening to the stories that they tell me. Because, you know, you're, you know, one of the world's eminent researchers in sleep. I love research, but I also love real life. What happens at the coalface when I'm seeing patients? What do they tell me is working? What do they tell me they're struggling with? That also influences a lot of my recommendations as well as the science. You know, if you can marry those two together, I think that's when we can make a real difference with people. And I also went to a conference in uh, San Diego about two years ago, and the whole conference was on sleep and relaxation and and rest. And and I think it was uh, Phyllis Zay. Do you know Phyllis? Phyllis Z, yeah. Yeah, 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 Phyllis Z. She gave a couple of keynotes there. Um, And I thought, God, this really is whetting my appetite. It's really reinforcing what I'm seeing in my practice. As I say, when you look at the research, I thought, well, how can I write a lifestyle book that is that is to empower people to take control of their health and not cover sleep? You know, I can't do it. I, I just, you know, I can't. I just I, well, can't do so, it. What's so interesting about that is, you know, you had, you know, all of this time at medical school in practice, you know, and it took a conference. Yeah. You know that you, you know, through your own sheer interest and desire my own to try money, and my help, own sort of annual leave to go and do this. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm interested. That's where you got your sleep education, and you know that that strikes me as as so, you know, unfortunate. You know, I want to think, I want to work with medical systems to try and increase, you know, a sleep education component. Because wouldn't it be wonderful if all of our primary care physicians here in the United Kingdom were, you know, as sleep aware and sleep motivated as you are? And I'm sure they would be delighted to receive that information. You know, I know have lots of friends here who are who are doctors and you know, I know that they would embrace that and would love to try and increase wellness in their patients, but there's just no pathway that we've engineered in the medical system to gift them with that knowledge and dispense wellness to their patients because sleep really is the tide that raises all of the other health boats. It's just as you said, it's the superordinate node that if you manipulate it, you know, it's like the Archimedes lever, you pull that, everything else you know, can start to come into play. Yeah, you get the sleep better, it affects your brain, it affects your hormones, it affects your genetic expression, it affects yep. all these sort of things that we might be looking for drugs to to affect those individual pathways, but you can improve a lot of them by, by improving your sleep. Yeah, you know, and it's no, we, we think, well, that sounds almost too good, but don't forget, you know, it took Mother Nature 3.6 million years to evolve this necessity of eight hours of sleep in place, which I should note, by the way, that if you look at the data, Back in the 1940s, the average adult was sleeping about uh, 7.9 hours of sleep. Now that number here in the United Kingdom is closer to 6 hours and 30 minutes. In other words, within the space of 100 years, which is a blink of an evolutionary eye, we've lopped off almost 20% of our sleep need. You know, how could that not come with demonstrable health and disease consequence? So I think, you know, there's that component there. But I love what you were saying that, you know, in medicine, we're often, or even in research and pharmaceuticals, we're often trying to sort of manipulate one pathway in one area of the metabolic system or one aspect of the immune yeah. system or one feature of the cardiovascular system. And, you know, sleep affects all of those. And we can, you know, I'll give you an example. Firstly, we know that after, if you get a patient and you have them who, um, sleeping just six hours for one week, this is someone, let's say, who is healthy. At the end of that one week of short sleep, their blood sugar levels are disrupted so significantly that they would be pre-diabetic, that you would diagnose them as being in a state of pre-diabetic. Just from sleep deprivation. Just from sleep deprivation. We control all of the factors. Um, You can also speak about sleep loss and uh, the cardiovascular system. And all it takes is one hour of lost sleep because there is a global experiment that's performed on 1.6 billion people across 70 countries twice a year, and it's called daylight savings time. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, And it turns out that when you look at that data in the spring, when we lose an hour of sleep, we see a subsequent 24% increase in heart attacks as a result. It's just incredible. But in it? the autumn, you know, when we gain an hour of sleep, we see a 21% reduction in heart attacks. So, so the data is there on, on a global level, the isn't it? Just you know, from that. It's striking, you know, and you can even think, you know, you speak a lot about, um, you know, the immune system. It's so key for our health. So what, to tell us, what does sleep do for the immune system? So firstly, we can look on both sides of the coin. What happens when we don't get enough sleep? Firstly, we know that people who are sleeping five hours a night are four times more likely to catch a cold than those people who are sleeping eight hours or more. Striking study, very well controlled study. 
Um, we also know that it doesn't take one week of, you know, short sleep deprivation. One night is enough. What we've found is that if you take healthy individuals and then we limit them to just four hours of sleep for one single night, what we see is a 70% drop in critical anti-cancer fighting immune cells called natural killer cells, which are these wonderful sort of immune assassins that, you know, help decrease our, you know, sort of, you know, cancer risk. Yeah. And, and, and help us fight infection. And fight you know, infection. Part of our innate immune system. The, exactly. Yeah. Part of that critical innate immune response. Flip the, the, the sort of the side of the coin. And now what we find is that when you get sleep, there is a change in what we call the autonomic nervous system, which is sort of this automatic part of our nervous system. And that automatic nervous system is split into two branches. One that is sort of like the accelerator pedal that gets us revved up, triggers the fight or flight response. The other is the brake that sort of calms us down. And when we go into deep sleep, we apply that brake to the nervous system and everything quiets down. Heart rate decreases. Deep sleep is the most wonderful form of natural blood pressure medication that you could ever wish for. Yeah. But one of the other things is that we see as that nervous system quiets down, levels of things like cortisol drop down, that stress-related chemical. And it's during that time that the body goes into an immune stimulation mode. And it's where essentially you're going to restock the armament of your immune army so that when you wake up the next day, you can battle and fight infection. What's also fascinating, and I love this data, and this tells you just how critical sleep is to, to a fighting uh, for our health. If you look at people who become infected or you actually infect them in the experimental laboratory, let's say with yeah. sort of a, a cold uh, vaccine, or um, you immediately trigger increased sleepiness and increased amounts of deep sleep. And it turns out that the infection indicates to the immune system that you're under attack and the immune system will actually signal to the sleep system within the brain, we need more sleep. Sleep is the best battle force that we have right now to combat this assault. And so that's why when you're sick, all you tend to want to do is just curl up in bed and go to sleep. The reason is because your body is trying to sleep you well. It's an appropriate response to what's going on, right? Exactly. It, so bodies are pretty clever, right? It, they are remarkably clever. You know, m m again, Mother Nature has figured this out. And so she brings up this thing called sleep, which I would argue is probably like the Swiss army knife of health. You know, whatever ailment you are facing, it is more than likely that sleep has a tool in the box to try and help fight it. That's so key. Whatever ailment you're facing, guys, if you listen to this, whatever you're suffering from, whether it's you know, a lack of energy on a day-to-day -day basis, or whether it's that you're worried about your risk of developing a chronic disease such as type 2 diabetes or heart problems as you get older, you know, what Matthew is saying, what Professor Walker is saying is that sleep, improving your quality of sleep is going to help you with all these different facets. It's gonna help reduce your risk, it's gonna help increase your energy, it's also gonna reduce your risk of actually getting disease in the future, which is just absolutely incredible. I mean, we are gonna move on to um, tips, because I know many of you will be thinking, okay, this is all great, you know, I, I'm sort of hearing about all these things that sleep does, but how do I get more? So we're gonna we're gonna to come to that shortly, but so much I wanna to talk to you about, Matthew. I mean, I think we could easily make this like a, a full day podcast. I, I'm that fascinated in this. <laughs> I'd but, love to return at some point, should you wish me to. Yeah, well, 100%, but I think, you know, what you said about um, medical school training, I think, I think it's very important because pretty much everything that I put in here, and then the last quarter of the book is on sleep, I'm not convinced that any of that came from my medical school training. So that was all self-taught from, you know, spending hours on PubMed, reading research, going to conferences, trying to learn more because I wanted to help my patients more. And I thought, you know, I need to know more about this so I can actually do my patients, you know, and give them a better service. Um, so you're saying that, you know, maybe medical students uh, may, may get maybe uh, two hours or so. And you'd love to sort of try and help that and get, you know, maybe a sleep curriculum into medical schools. And yeah. this really, you know, I think one of the reasons we get on so well is there's so much synergy in our in our viewpoint in terms of how we think this needs to change. So what I've done over the past six months is um, 
is develop a brand new course with a colleague of mine, Dr. Panjir, called Prescribing Lifestyle Medicine. And it's a one day masterclass to teach healthcare professionals, but primarily doctors, on the basics of, you know, lifestyle medicine, if you will, as a term. You know, so we go into sleep and we we teach this framework where they can simply apply these these four pillars with their patients to start to actually you know, implement lifestyle medicine. I'd love to, you know, I'd love to maybe collaborate with you and show oh, you the I'd slides. Love, yeah, and... I'd love to. And, and I've got, you know, I teach a whole course at, uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, the science of sleep. So I've got lots of uh, slides. I'd love to just share and do whatever I could to try and help sort of perpetuate that movement that you've got going. I, it's wonderful. That's exactly what we need. Yeah. And then maybe we can talk about how we get that into medical schools and, you know. Yeah, I was going to actually ask you, you know, you know, how could we, you know, um, even collectively, you know, think about trying to, you know, approach sort of medicine here in the United Kingdom and see if we yeah. could. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that off the off uh, air from the absolutely. podcast. That I think that good. could be a great collaboration. Um, okay, Matthew, I know you're short on time. And again, we could just go on for so long. I was going to ask you about um, sleep and stress, but I think, you know, guys, for those of you listening to this, I cover that in quite a bit of detail, I think, with you on my chat that's on my Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash Dr. Chatterjee. Um, so, guys, you can actually check it out there. But everything that Matthew and I talk about, including that Lancet paper that he mentioned, is going to be in the show notes, which is going to be at drchatterjee.com forward slash why we sleep there's going to be links there to everything matthew talks about some of matthew's articles his book all kinds of things so guys do check that out after the podcast and you can do a bit of further reading on those topics that interest you um so yeah where to go to next i mean one thing that we do talk about on that course and i think we've not spoken about this yet is about sleep and its role in mental health Mm. and you know What's interesting, you mentioned bi-directional relationships before and how a lack of sleep can increase our risk of problems, but also sleep can be a treatment as well for various things. And I wonder if you could talk about that in relation to mental health problems such as anxiety and depression, and maybe from then just move briefly on to Alzheimer's if possible. Yeah. So we've done a lot of work in this area of sort of sleep and, and mental health. I think the first point to note is that we have not been able to discover a single psychiatric condition in which sleep is normal. Wow. And I think sleep has a profound story to tell in our understanding, um, in our treatment, maybe even ultimately at some point our prevention of grave mental illness. And I don't say that flippantly. Firstly, um, we've done some work where you can take healthy individuals and you can deprive them of sleep for a, a single night. And then you place them inside an MRI scanner and you look at how their brain has changed. And what we find is that these deep emotional brain centers erupt when you're sleep deprived. You become a lot more emotionally reactive, impulsive. There's a deep brain center called the amygdala, which is one of the centerpiece regions for the generation of strong emotions. That part of the brain is up to 60% more reactive when you're sleep deprived relative to when you've had a good solid night of sleep. And we've also found a huge amount. (laughs) It's a 60 percent. It's very difficult to usually see that type of a change in the brain without some kind of pathology or drug. And I think think, deprivation. I think on an intuitive level, most people recognize that when they haven't slept well, you know, they're just a little bit more reactive to things that that email from a boss from their boss, for example, can be easily misinterpreted. You know, they annoyed at me. They you know, you suddenly start to see things that aren't there. And I. I, I've just, as I mentioned this before, I've, I've just completed my second book called The Stress Solution, which is going to come out in January. And I cover a little bit of this that you're talking about in that to really try and show people that, you know, lack of sleep is a stress on our body. And 60%, that's incredible. Change in the brain, yeah. And I think it really comes, you know, you, you're absolutely right. Many of us have a sense that, you know, I just snapped dot, dot, dot. You know, those are the words that usually follow a you know bad night of sleep or when you've not got enough sleep. And we know it all the way down sort of the, the age chain. You know, you think about a parent holding a child, the child is crying and they look at you and they say, well, they just didn't sleep well last night. As yeah. if there's some universal knowledge that bad sleep the night before equals bad mood and emotional yeah, reactivity course. the next day. And it doesn't stop in infancy or childhood or adolescence. It's true when we are adults as well. And we've seen this data. What I think is 
concerning is that that neurological signature that we discovered in that uh, study is not dissimilar to numerous psychiatric conditions. And in fact, we're now finding significant links between sleep disruption and depression, anxiety, uh, including uh, um, PTSD, schizophrenia, and most recently and tragically, suicide as well. Um, in fact, a short sleep duration is usually predictive of either suicidal ideation, suicidal thoughts, suicide attempts, and tragically, suicide completion. So I think there are the, sco the scope uh, through which sleep is impacting mental health disease, I think, is considerable. Um, we used to think in psychiatry that the psychiatric disease was perhaps causing the sleep disruption. I think now we've been forced to change our minds. It's not as though it's completely in the opposite direction. It's not that every psychiatric condition is a sleep disorder. That's not true either. But is it a two-way street? I think that that's probably more tenable. In fact, is, it, is the dominant flow of traffic perhaps more in one direction than the other? I think that's also reasonable to assume on the basis of the data right now as well. So I think it's, you know, there's clearly an intimate relationship between our mental health and our sleep health. Matthew, the, these, you know, the, the implications of what you just said, I think, are so profound. We've got to accept in the 21st century, not only do we not prioritize sleep enough, we are a chronically sleep deprived society. We're now going through a mental health epidemic. You know, Mind, uh, the charity here in the UK, say that about one in four people in the UK now in any given year are going to be diagnosed with a mental health problem. Right, now that's incredible. And when you hear about that research, we think chronically sleep deprived society, mental health problems on the rise. Yes, there are other factors, okay? I don't yeah, think, I, yeah. I don't think you we both or, of us agree on that. Yeah, we're not trying general. to say it's all to do with sleep, but what we are trying to say is that sleep is a critical part of the equation and one that we can no longer afford to ignore. Um, so I find that research fascinating. You know, and it makes me think as a doctor, you know, you've mentioned already type 2 diabetes, heart disease, mental health problems such as depression and anxiety. You know, I know at our previous discussion, again, guys, I'd point you to that Facebook discussion because we won't have time to go into this today, but we will want to get you back on the podcast. Um, on our Facebook discussion, we did go into Alzheimer's and how, you know, sleep deprivation you feel may be causative now or, a, or one of the causative factors that causes Alzheimer's disease. That's right. I, I'm thinking, well, you know, I, I, I often say this when I'm teaching doctors, you know, why are we not bringing up sleep quality with pretty much every single patient that walks in through our door. You know, and you could imagine the cost savings to, um, you know, our economy. In fact, the Rand Corporation recently did a survey, the, the enormous cost of sleep deprivation throughout a number of developed nations. What they found was that a lack of sleep costs most nations about 2% of their GDP. So here in the United Kingdom, that's 30 billion pounds of lost economic value caused by insufficient sleep. In the United States, it was $411 billion. In Japan, it was $138 billion. In other words, if you solve the sleep loss epidemic, you know, imagine you could almost double the budget for education or you could perhaps even half the healthcare deficit. You know, Theresa May just this week, uh, as we're speaking here, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, um, described a £20 billion injection of funds into the national healthcare system. Um, and... This uproar about where that money is going to come from. <laughs> sure. Well, you know, if we just simply prioritized and solved the sleep epidemic, the sleep loss epidemic, um, we could cover that and still have 10 billion pounds left over. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and, you know, this, this podcast doesn't sound to be too political, but I would, I would say that, you know, I find a lot of the messaging around the NHS in public very short sighted. It's about pumping more money in to fix downstream issues, whereas we've got to look at, at prioritizing sleep as a society, whether it's the lighting that's used in hospitals when patients are trying to recover from illness, yeah. Yeah. which isn't very helpful a lot of the time, whether it's teaching our children about it and encouraging good habits, you know, at school, but also as parents with our kids, really ingraining. And I think, you know, we've not really got into technology today and how the overuse of technology can potentially be problematic for sleep. Um, I agree, sleep, it's such a it's such a simple lever to turn. It's also, it's, well, we'll come into tips in just a second, but, you know, so many health inequalities are there from people from different socioeconomic groups. We know 
in the UK that you know you can have as much of a 10 year difference in your life expectancy depending on where you live. One thing I like about a focus on sleep, and I appreciate that there are many pressures in deprived communities, you know, financial stresses, uh, you know, maybe a lot of shift work, maybe working multiple jobs. So I absolutely understand and recognize that there are significant issues that we have to overcome. But a lot of the recommendations that we're now going to talk about that I cover in my book and you cover in detail in your book, most of the recommendations to help people to, you know, get more quality sleep are free of charge. Yeah. You know, I often say that I think sleep is perhaps the most democratically freely available healthcare system for everyone around the world. Now, that's a bit of a glib statement on the basis of exactly what you just said, I think, about. And the data is quite frightening. Um, We've been looking at this, too, at sort of low socioeconomic status um, communities. And there, what you'd see is just what you described, you know, higher general social stress that impairs sleep. Um, usually working multiple different jobs, split shifts, working the night work. Often people in those communities are working in the service industry. That usually means that you're either up very early or you're staying in work very late, all of which comprise you know, factors that work against sleep. So I want to be really appreciative of that. Yeah, but still, I think you know the tips that we can do right now to start sleeping better every night should be applicable and for the most part utilized by just about everyone, as long as you don't have a sleep disorder. Well, Matthew, normally I I end the podcast off by asking people for four key tips um, that people can put into practice immediately. But we don't have to limit it to four. You know, I I, I want this podcast to inspire people to not only take sleep seriously, but to give them some practical help. So immediately after listening to this, I can put the headphones down and go, right, I'm going to do what Professor Walker's asked me to do. I'm going to try you know, these five things today. In your experience, and you've been interviewed all around the world now to do with your book, what what are those common things that people aren't doing that they could do to help improve their sleep? Yeah, so there's probably um, maybe five things um, that people can do right now to get better sleep. The first is regularity. Um, Going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time, no matter what, even if you've had a bad night of sleep, still try to wake up at the same time, just understand it's gonna be a tough next day, and then get to bed at the same time that following night and you'll have a good night of sleep. You'll sort of sleep a little bit more soundly that night. Even if it's the weekday or the weekend, don't do so what we call social jet lag, yeah. which is sort of where you sort of sleep too late at the weekend. And then on Sunday night, you've got to drag your body clock all the way back and try and force it to, to sleep at a time when you haven't been sleeping before. That's torture. Regularity is key. The second thing is temperature. We've spoken a little bit about that, but keep your bedroom cool. Um, Probably around about 18 degrees Celsius, which is colder than most people think, but cooling the room down takes your body into that right sort of thermal space for good sleep. It cools it down. Darkness, we've spoken about too, but we are, I think, a dark deprived society in this modern era. And you need darkness at night to allow the release of a hormone called melatonin, which helps time the healthy onset of your sleep. So yes, it's to do with blue light sort of emitting devices, screens, phones. Those are things that you should try and stay away from in the last hour before bed. But it's not just that. It's also overhead lighting. You know, we don't need to be bathed in electric light all night. In the last hour before bed, just try turning half of the lights off in your flat or in your home. You'd be surprised at how soporific and sleepy you become when you're shrouded in darkness. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing is, I would say, walk it out. And what I mean by that is don't stay in bed if you've been awake for 20 or 25 minutes, either trying to fall asleep or you've woken up and you're trying to get back to sleep. The reason is because your brain is this wonderfully associative device and it will start to very quickly learn that being in bed is about being awake rather than asleep. So what you need to do is after about 25 minutes, just relax, understand that sleep is not quite here yet. Go to a different room in dim light, read a book or listen to a podcast, um, but don't check email, don't eat because it trains your brain to expect that in the middle of the night. Only return to bed when you are very sleepy. And that way your brain will start to relearn the association that your bedroom is the place of sleep rather than the place of sleep. I think that's a really important tip, Matthew, that, you know, 
I know even from our first conversation on Facebook, but you know, whenever I talk about sleep, you know, people can often get really wound up about this and say, you know, I'm, I'm doing all those things, I I can't sleep, and they've, you know, they've they've really just, you know, without without trying to, their brain has just got into this position where it's been trained not to sleep, it's been trained to not associate the bedroom with sleep, or you know, so many people I see, you know, when I hear about on social media are doing work emails right up to the moment they fall asleep and and yeah. you know you we mentioned children before and I, I i often say you know children need a bedtime routine we know that <laughs> why as adults do we think we're any different we should and, and you're absolutely right you know we've turned the bed uh in this day and age often you know into a kitchen we've turned it into an office we've turned it into a cinema <laughs> you know we do all of these things typically on the bed which then it does impact the brain's association it gets quite confused about what this thing called the bed is is all about um so i think that that's a that's a very helpful tip and try not to get too anxious if you're sort of falling asleep i know that probably a lot of what i've been telling people will make you feel anxious if you're not being able to get the sleep that you need but try not to worry about it everyone has a bad night of sleep just get up understand that you're going to be awake for a little bit longer and then go back to bed and, and you will start to relearn that association and, and in fact a lot of um you know people and patients will say to me well you know i've been falling asleep on the settee watching television and then I get into bed and I'm wide awake and I don't know why. And again, it's because of this association that you've learned with the bed. The final two things, um, one of which we've mentioned, is what you intake into your body, caffeine and alcohol. We've spoken about caffeine, but I'll speak about alcohol quickly. Many people use uh, alcohol as a sleep aid, and it is anything but an assistant to sleep. Alcohol is a class of drugs that we call the sedatives, um, and sedation is not sleep, unfortunately. Yeah. It's very, sedation is not sleep. It's very it. different. Um, so what you're doing when you have a nightcap or you use alcohol to try and get to sleep, and many people do, understandably so, they mistake one for the other. You're just knocking your cortex out. You're not in natural sleep. The two other problems with alcohol and sleep, firstly, alcohol will fragment your sleep. So if I were to record someone's sleep in the laboratory after they've had a couple of drinks, their sleep is littered with all of these awakenings throughout the night. Now, you tend not to remember waking up, but the next day you feel, again, unrefreshed. You don't feel sort of bright and alert or restored by your sleep, but you don't remember waking up, so you don't link it to the alcohol. But alcohol is bad at fragmenting your sleep, produces poor quality. The final thing alcohol is good at doing is blocking your dream sleep or your REM sleep. And we know, to come back to our conversation, REM sleep is critical for emotional first aid. REM sleep provides um, overnight therapy. It's a form of emotional convalescence. And alcohol will block that REM sleep quite viciously. So those would be the five tips, I think, for better sleep. Yeah, Matthew, thanks. I, I love that. Um, just, just to say on alcohol, is it dose dependent? So... For example, you know, some people say, well, I'm okay with one glass of wine, but two or three glasses is going to fragment my sleep. You know, it, can you comment on, on the dosage there? Or would you advise people who are struggling with sleep yeah. to knock it on its head, basically? I know, and I, it's so hard for me to answer this. And this is the reason, one of the re many reasons why I'm such a deeply unpopular person. But um, I don't think that's know, fair to say. But, <laughs> I, 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 but you know, I, firstly, I don't want to sound puritanical. You know, life is to be lived yeah. to a degree. And all of these things that we're discussing, oh, we're trying to speak about the extremes. Um, but I also want to empower people with the knowledge. I'm not here to tell you necessarily what you should or you shouldn't do. I just want to give you the scientific facts and then you can make the choice. I would say, unfortunately, that even just one glass of alcohol in the evening we can we can see that we can measure that you can measure that in your lab that you can see that, that you're not getting the same deep level of restorative sleep yep. even with one drink even with one drink so i know it's hard but now you know everyone you know should you know have a social life and sort of you know enjoy a drink now and again i think the best advice would be this if you're going to bed feeling tipsy you probably have had too much alcohol in yeah. terms of sleep impairment russell i want to just ask you your view on my interpretation of my dad's working life. I know from research, you've written a beautiful section on it in, in your new book, about the impacts that sleep deprivation has on the immune system. Yeah. And all kinds of other 
yeah. biological processes in the body. My dad, at the age of 57, got lupus. Hmm. Now, it's very unusual for an Asian man, an Asian man who is slim. Mm. It's, it's not the profile. It's normally Caucasian women, mm. in their 30s or 40s. Mm. But typically, of course, there's always variation here. Now, for many years, I cared for my dad until he died uh, nine and a half years ago. And I didn't know then what I know now since his death. But I am convinced, like I have a deep knowing that my dad's lifestyle gave him lupus. Now, I'm not asking you to say yes or no on that. I just want to share with you certain aspects of his lifestyle. And I'd be interested in your perspective. My dad slept three nights a week for 30 years. So he'd work his day job as a consultant at Manchester Royal Infirmary, but he'd come home, he'd get ready. And then for four nights a week, Carl would pick him up and he'd be doing GP house calls all night. So he'd be out all night. He'd arrive again at 7, 7.15 in the morning, get ready, then drive through traffic into Manchester and work. Mm. So for 30 years, he only slept for three nights a week. So that is sleep deprivation, I would say, at a hyper extreme level. He was chronically stressed, of course. Mm -hmm. I hear what you say about empathy and I think about mom and dad's rows. Yeah. Um, and yes, you need a genetic susceptibility for autoimmune disease, but I believe my dad had that genetic susceptibility. I know he did because I've, I've done my genetic, I've done some of my testing and I know I have a predisposition as well to certain things. If the environmental conditions are right, my dad had chronic sleep deprivation, chronic stress, something maybe out with your expertise perhaps is I think my dad was very unhappy and had a lot of unexpressed emotions and anger about the state of his life. I've spoken to Dr. Gabor Mate, a physician, about the, the link between unexpressed emotion and also immune disease. So I'm not necessarily asking you to comment on that, but from what I've shared and from what you know about the immune system and sleep deprivation's impact, do you have any comments at all? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's worth bearing in mind that for our biology to work, you need the right stuff, at the right concentration delivered to the right tissues and organs at the right time of day. And of course, our circadian and sleep-wake systems do that. So if you disrupt them, you have uh, a whole bunch of vulnerable points where things could fall apart. Sorry to interrupt. If you are enjoying this content, there's loads more just like it on my channel. So please do take a moment to press subscribe, hit the notification bell, and now back to the conversation. And so if you have a genetic susceptibility, then the disrupted biology will, will play to that, that problem. And so I wouldn't be at all surprised if there was an element of sleep disruption. Did your father show any signs of dementia later in, in life? It's really hard because his dad was on dialysis for 15 years and all kinds of medications. But yeah, I'd probably say so, little bits. Yeah, uh, No formal diagnosis, but if I think back now... Possibly, probably. Yeah. And um, some very interesting uh, data is showing that massive sleep weight disruption in the middle years can increase your risk of dementia uh, in later years. What, what do middle years mean? Um, so, so in your, your, your sort of 40s, 50s, right. um, your, your peak working period, we, you know, where we think of our businessmen, you know, uh, having incredibly shortened um, sleep periods. And it's, it's been well known, it's been documented, but a mechanism has not been clear until relatively recently, or a potential mechanism. Mm. And that's this newly discovered thing, which is the glymphatic system, this sort of um, clearance system within the brain. And whilst we're asleep, um, there's a whole bunch of toxic stuff that is wrapped up and disposed of, not least beta amyloid. Yeah. And just one night of no sleep has been shown to increase beta amyloid deposition within the brain and increase the concentration in the cerebral spinal fluid. So, you know, there's a there's a very tangible link between sleep disruption in the middle years and and a mechanism that could 
could predispose to dementia in, in later years. And I think we're going to find increasingly these sorts of connections. Yeah. I mean, what we know about the immune system is that it's, it's turned up, or at least the adaptive immune system is turned up during the day when we're most likely to encounter people with bugs or bugs in the environment, and then turned down at night. And again, a really interesting question is, well, why? Why do you have the immune system on full kilter all the time? And that's, of course, because if you did you increase the chances of an autoimmune response. Yeah. And so, you know, disruption of these systems leads to lots of different ripple-through effects. Yeah, there was something in the book where I found fascinating about our skin permeability it's, changes yeah. throughout the day. Could you yeah. speak to that, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, it's, so so at, at night, um, it's, it's a bit more porous, um, uh, and we're losing... As a result, we're losing water. And so also it becomes itchier. And so we're more likely to scratch our skin at night and, you know, exacerbated by psoriasis and, and dermatitis and things. And so the skin is an incredibly effective barrier keeping bugs out. And that's why the, the main route of, of infection is the lungs. Or, uh, but, uh, but, 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 the, if, if, but the skin is, again, trying to slough off these old cells um, and presumably the bacteria with them and, in a sense, sort of cleanse itself yeah. but it increases the vulnerability to infection does it at that time of day of course because we're far less likely to encounter bugs at that particular time yeah there was also this fascinating bit of research you shared where i think if if we get cut or have a scar yes. mm. or how well it will heal or how quickly it will heal depends on whether it was done in the morning or the evening. Yeah, I found absolutely. that fascinating. Yes, it, it is. You know, and of course, um, uh, more effective healing during the day than, than at night. Yeah. yeah. This relationship between midlife sleep deprivation, so in our 40s and 50s, and dementia later on, is really something just to pause on. Perhaps because I'm in my early 40s, um, perhaps because I know many listeners and viewers are. But there is this tendency, I think, across society to think we can keep pushing. Yeah. We can keep pushing. We'll get away with it. We'll be okay. Now, I've seen first time with my dad. Yes, it was quite extreme. But nonetheless, I see that pattern. I've seen it in myself before. I've yeah. seen it in a lot of my patients and a lot of my friends. You can't keep pushing your biology and not expect a consequence at some point. So I, I just wanted to highlight that point. And then I want to, you know, you mentioned sleep and dementia. I know you've done a lot of research on the relationship between sleep and mental health problems. Yes. And I'd love to just talk about this a little bit. You know, is it sleep deprivation that's causing mental health problems? Is it mental health problems that's causing sleep deprivation? Or like most things, is it a bit of both? Well, I think this is really important. And I got into this because I was um, in an elevator with a psychiatrist. And he said to me, oh, yeah, you work on, on sleep and stuff. I said, yes, yeah, kind of. Um, and um, he said, well, of course, my patients with schizophrenia, um, they have terrible sleep patterns. That's because they don't have a job. So they get up late, uh, miss my clinic, and are socially isolated, and so don't have friends. And I just thought at the time that doesn't make any sense at all to me. And so we we started, um, and Katarina Wolf was one of my colleagues um, who was very much involved in this, to look at sleep-wake patterns in individuals with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, uh, same number of individuals age-matched who are unemployed, and working healthy controls. And the patterns you saw in schizophrenia were some of the most extraordinary observations I've ever made in my career. These weren't just sort of kindly, mildly disrupted. These rhythms were absolutely smashed in every one we have looked at. Um, and so that stuck in my mind. And then with an increasing understanding of the mechanisms that generate sleep and circadian rhythms. So essentially, the sleep, the consciousness sleep flip involves a realignment of every brain neurotransmitter system and an interaction between multiple brain structures. So with these two sort of observations, we thought, well, hang on, why do you always find sleep-wake disruption? and mental health associated. And, and of course, you see it in bipolar, you see it in depression, you see it everywhere. And we came up with a model 
which was perhaps at the core within the brain, there are overlapping neural circuits and neurotransmitter pathways between stable sleep and stable mental health. So if you're predisposed to mental health problems, let's say there's a change in a a neurotransmitter, dopamine, serotonin, that nudges you towards a mental health crisis, but it's going to have a parallel impact upon the sleep-wake systems at some level because they also draw from those neurotransmitter systems. And so we then tested that hypothesis. And so genes which have been linked to human schizophrenia when mutated in a mouse, um, uh, not only showed weird behavioural patterns, uh, but also smashed sleep-wake cycles. So now there's an incredible body of evidence for that mechanistic overlap between mental health circuits and sleep circuits. But it's, of course, much more complicated than that because the disrupted sleep via its impact upon um, psychosocial health, um, one's, one's ability to process information, that negative salience, and of course the sort of physiological disruption could uh, exacerbate the extent to which you're experiencing mental health problems. And of course the mental health problems will feed back and make the sleep worse. And so you can very rapidly go from sort of this this sort of overlap at the middle, we know there's a ge- genetic predisposition to certain mental health, mental health conditions. But it can then amplify massively as a result of these positive feedback loops, the mental health making the sleep worse, the sleep making the mental health worse. So you can exaggerate it completely. So we then thought, well, hang on, if we try to stabilize sleep wake in individuals exhibiting mental health problems, will we reduce the severity of those mental health problems? So working with Dan Freeman and Colin Espy, a big paper was published a few years ago, in The Lancet, uh, which showed that if you can even partially stabilise the sleep-wake in individuals, you can reduce levels of paranoia and hallucinatory experiences. So I think we can can think of the sleep-wake systems as being a new therapeutic target for mental health. Now, what's fascinating for me is that we've known about the association between mental health problems and, and sleep disruption back at, you know... Kraepelin's time in the 1880s, he talked about it way before the introduction of antipsychotics and and all of the other sort of um, issues. And so it has a long history. And uh, of course, the life expectancy of individuals with severe mental health uh, is hugely reduced. And they all report, you know, what do they report? Um, uh, Sort of coronary heart disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, all of these major health issues dismissed as as a byproduct product of the antipsychotics. But actually, it's a major contributing factor to that will be the the poor sleep. And it's never addressed. Yeah. Um, and so this, I'm, I'm hoping that this will, will, will also provide a, a change in our mindset to, to these extraordinarily vulnerable individuals and to take their sleep-wake disruption seriously because we have empirical evidence yeah. that even partial stabilization can reduce the severity of um, those symptoms. You're effectively saying bipolar or depression or anxiety, right? Instead of just accepting it as, oh yes, people with these conditions don't sleep well. It's like, Mm. well, hold on a minute. What if we go straight in and give sleep education or sleep CBC or whatever therapy we might deem appropriate? And then if you think about research, I mean, I remember reading a paper, Russell, where it showed that maybe if you go from eight hours a night to five hours a night, your amygdala, the emotional part of your brain, maybe up to 50% more reactive. Yeah. I think, well, that's kind of anxiety. You know, yep. if your amygdala is on high alert, you're anxious. Yes. And sleep deprivation by itself will make you anxious. Yeah. So before we go to anti-anxiety medications or... Exactly. It's like, why don't we tackle the sleep? Exactly. Why don't we at least try to? And, and it's because uh, the failure to educate our, our general practitioners and indeed our, the entire um, you know, doc, doctor and nurse community, um, it's just not part of the curriculum. And in yeah. fairness, um, it's only fairly recently that this stuff has become really clear. Yeah. Um, and, and again, that was part of the, the reason for, for, for writing you know, Lifetime, because wanting to make it accessible to you know, not only medical practitioners, but everybody, so we can take some ownership of this, of this field, this yeah. critically important field. I mean, this is really quite profound, because what we're talking about here is sleep as therapy. Yes, I mean, this was really 
sort of shown, shown to me when we were working with, on a project with, with um, Guy Goodwin, who's a psychiatrist at Oxford, and he was able to identify individuals as a result of family history and questionnaires, whether they were at high risk or low risk of developing bipolar. So these are young, young individuals in their their teens usually. And what was absolutely fascinating is the sleep-wake patterns of those at low risk were perfectly normal. But all of those who were at high risk were already showing a disrupted sleep-wake pattern Mm -hmm. prior to any clinical diagnosis of bipolar. Now, if we can use this as an early marker, and then of course in therapy, the earlier we, we know something's going to go wrong, the earlier the chance of an intervention. So wouldn't it be amazing if we could identify those individuals at risk, we could institute sleep-wake stabilization protocols that may either delay the onset of these conditions or knock the brain into a di- different developmental trajectory whereby it won't necessarily go yeah. uh, inevitably towards that uh, condition. So again, I think there's... You know, we're, we're, we're just sort of unmasking all this incredibly important stuff that could have a major impact upon health yeah. and well-being uh, as, uh, in the coming decades. Let's talk about sex and sleep. Yeah. Um, you write a little bit about it, of course. It's a topic of huge interest to many people. Yeah. And I guess there's two facets to it the way I see it. One is to do with fertility, mm. right? There is an ideal time to have sex from a fertility standpoint. So I think it'd be great to talk about that. Yeah. But then I think also the relationship between sex and sleep, the onset of sleep, I think is also really interesting. Yeah. So um, in whatever way you want to, well, maybe start to uh, unpack uh, that I for mean, me. I mean, again, this was something that I wasn't particularly familiar with until I did the research for the book, because I'm not often asked these questions in public lectures. What was absolutely striking is that every element in the regulation of the female menstrual cycle involves a circadian clock, whether it's the timed release of hormones, of the, the neurohormones in the hypothalamus, whether it's the pituitary gland, or whether it's the receptors in the ovary, for example, responding to those, those, those hormones. And so you've got, for example, very strong evidence that disruption of the menstrual cycle is much worse in night shift workers. Um, the chances of miscarriage is higher in night shift workers. It's not hugely significant, but it is significant. And you find that in the airline industry, either pilots or flight attendants have fertility problems. So there's, there's clearly a relationship between the circadian system uh, and the menstrual cycle to produce this extraordinary, exquisitely timed ovulation and the release of the release of the egg. And it's been shown that sperm needs to be in the reproductive tract in the fallopian tube around about two to three days prior to ovulation to have the greatest chances of success. So there's, 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 there's that, there's the, the circadian system interacting with the hormones that drive the menstrual cycle, yeah. uh, which is, and, and that precise window. And, and, and that was really fascinating. And then you've got this study is suggesting, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, w- humans don't have any real discrimination. They'll just do it whenever they want to do it. Um, and then there's this whole literature on the fact that, in fact, our behavior is subtly altered. So that actually um, during that sort of pre-ovulatory window, men are less discriminating of women um, and are much more likely to seek out you know, copulatory experiences. Um, and females are much more discriminatory. They're far more likely to have an affair during that, that window. Wow. And they look for male, they're more interested in male features. So for example, um, a deeper voice, a stronger jawline, all that sort of thing. Wow. I mean, stuff that we never really think about, but but there is there is that still biology, you know, underpinning it. Wow. So, so yeah. Um, but also, um, male fertility uh, seems to peak in the morning. Testosterone rises and has a you know, morning peak. And that's where sperm motility is uh, at its peak. And anyway, I mentioned this, I think, on the Chris Evans uh, breakfast show. And I got this email uh, several a month or so later um, from a couple of young medics who said, um, you know, we've been trying for the last two years um, to um, conceive. And, uh, um, you know, as medics, we thought we tried everything, but we've forgotten circadian rhythms. So we started, um, and their words, not mine, started doing it in the morning. And the first, and the first time we did it, you know, my, my partner got pregnant. Um, now, 
<laughs> I mean, an N of one is an N of one, so you can make of it what you will. But I was actually uh, thrilled <laughs> that, that 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 bit of biology had been translated. C- at least in one case. <laughs> yes, I know. even that that, that that line we forgot about circadian rhythms. Yeah. I'm not surprised. Like we didn't learn anything about circadian yeah. rhythms at medical school. I don't think they still do. No. Right? This is a you know massive, massive issue in terms of. We mentioned the problems with sleep deprivation and um, you've written a section in the book how the timing of sex could oh, potentially yes. help people with sleep. Yeah, I, I mean, I think anecdotally, um, the reports that, you know, sex relaxes individuals and they're more likely to fall asleep. And and there are now some studies suggesting yeah. that um, there, are, there are hormones that are, that are released which actually promote sleepiness. And so, yes, uh, consensual sex, of course, um, it has been shown to promote sleep. Yeah. And, and also masturbation as well. You have once said that... Many people don't have a sleep problem. Mm. They've got a stress problem. Yep. And I guess sex, intimacy, you know, switching off, it all kind of feeds into that a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely, yes. And and, and the bonding, following sex, um, uh, you know, relaxes individuals and brings them closer together. I, I, I think that one thing that's very important to distinguish is fatigue from sleepiness. Um, sleepiness is cured by sleep. Fatigue is this overwhelming chronic tiredness that even given the the ability to sleep longer doesn't go away. And it's very important that people distinguish between the two because fatigue, as you know, um, is indicative of some underlying health problem. Mm. And I spoke to somebody fairly recently, really fascinating, and this is um, a really high-powered individual, very, very active, but she has an immune issue and so is chronically fatigued. And so she can't get done what she wants to do during the day. So she'll fall asleep fine, and then she'll wake up in the middle of the night and we should talk about that because mm. that's perfectly normal to wake up in the middle yeah, of the sure. night and most of us fall back to sleep again or are awake for a short time and then fall back to sleep again. But because of her um, stress, because she couldn't do what she wanted to do, she couldn't fall back to sleep again. And so uh, it, uh, this was a really interesting... So the fatigue was was not allowing her to do what she wanted to do, which meant that she was immensely stressed, which meant that... It was screwing up her, her sleep problems. And so, uh, yeah, I think that so many instances of... I think stress is is one of the major issues in poor sleep. And as we've just said, yeah. it's not a sleep problem, it's a, it's a stress problem. And that's why sort of winding down um, towards the end of the day, leaving work at home, if you possibly can... Um, and doing something different, whether it's going to the gym, whether it's doing whatever, is so important. And that's, of course, been the huge problem um, during the COVID epidemic, yeah. where people's workspace and and home space were the same. And that's probably part of the reason why sleep um, has been reported to be worse in, in certain sectors. Yeah, I mean, you spoke before about various scents and what people associate with sleep. And, you know, we know the brain is an associative organ. And so... Yeah. If you are sitting with your laptop doing your work emails in bed, what does your brain associate with bed in the bedroom? Precisely. And of course, so many bedrooms became studies. Yeah, and, and I understand that it depends on your space and it's not yes. it's not a criticism, it's just more a an explanation. It's more an explanation that this yeah. can be problematic. I think, you know, I mentioned the 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 low lux amber bulbs that I have in my bedside lamps. And I think there's a biological explanation in terms of the lower lux, it's not pushing my circadian rhythm back, my clock's back, sure. But and, I actually think... And critically um, reducing your alertness, which is probably the main main factor. Okay, so it's yeah. reducing my alertness yep. because of the lower light. Exactly. Higher the light, greater the alertness, and the more, more difficult it is to get off to sleep. Okay, so that's fascinating and I guess speaks to, well... So many bathroom mirrors are <laughs> yes. like bathrooms oh. are full of these bright LEDs, right? Yeah. So what do people do before well, bed? I know. I mean, it's. I think it's absolutely spectacularly ironic that what's the last thing we do before we go to bed? We stand in the most brightly lit room of the house, which is the bathroom, and then we look into an illuminated mirror as we clean our teeth. Um, yeah. And you know, we talked about a, a, a an investment opportunity in developing night shift food. Another uh, a perfect investment opportunity is developing a bathroom 
mirror, which has bright alerting light in the morning and you switch it to the evening which is dimmer less alerting light um in in the evening yeah i mean it's simple yeah the technology is <laughs> there to do it absolutely yeah so that's that's something else we can think about what how you know what sort of light are we exposed to there but yeah. speaking about these bedside lamps i think also as well as the biological explanation i think there's also i guess something behavioral about them for me in terms of its it signals to me oh, it's now evening time, it's yeah. rest time, it's not stimulation time. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, I it's think sometimes... winding down. It's, we assume that we can go from a fully conscious state, yeah. you know, we, we, going, go, the gear analogy, you know, going from first gear to fifth gear. You yeah. can't do it. Um, you have to do it through stages. And again, winding down from the wake state to the sleep state requires an adjustment. Um, and whether that's, as, as you were saying, you, you enjoy reading um, some novel uh, under relatively dim light before going to bed. Some people listen to music or something else that they find relaxing. Relaxing. And it's and it's it's adopting those behaviours that make the transition easier. And again, it's 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 as you were saying, it's the brain knows what's coming next, and what's coming next is sleep, and yeah. so it can prepare itself. It's what we do with our kids, right? We give them a routine. You know, we, we don't, read a story. We yeah. read a story. We mm. we don't, as I often say in talks, we don't give them a ton of sugar, put the lights on bright, <laughs> speak loudly. No, no, we yeah. do the opposite of all those things, but. As adults, we kind of think we can somehow... Until their favourite uncle visits. You know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we think we can override them, but we can't. Oh, Russell, I could speak to you for hours. As we come towards the end of this conversation, a few things I wanted to uh, briefly cover, if possible. Sleep trackers. Huh. Uh, yeah. Mm. Um, any, any view on sleep trackers? Well, I think we should define where they could be useful. So... Um, most sleep trackers, uh, if you use them to determine roughly when you went to sleep, um, how many times you woke up in the night, for example, and when you finally woke up. So your sleep timing, your sleep duration, and your sleep fragmentation. That's a tried and tested technology, and it's what we use in the lab. The problem is that most of the, the trackers that people wear these days try and do more than that. They say, oh, you've had lots of good deep sleep or you haven't had enough REM sleep. And, and for that, they're completely useless. And um, they, can, they can generate huge anxiety. Um, so, so I spoke to an individual uh, again before lockdown who said, I'm not getting, I'm not getting enough slow wave sleep. I'm really anxious about it. In fact, what I do, I set my alarm clock for four o'clock in the morning, wake my fi myself up to to find out how much slow wave sleep I've had. I mean, that's the kind of level yeah. of anxiety that these things are, um, are developing. And in fact, so so what what does it really tell us if we've had lots of slow wave or lots of REM sleep? We don't really know. And the algorithms, first of all, are not very good at detecting that. Um, and they've been largely worked out for a bunch of 20-year-olds in California. Um, uh, and, and of course, our sleep changes yeah. <laughs> hugely as we <laughs> age um, and they're not going to work for somebody in their 70s or indeed you know somebody younger um, so, so until we got you know really sophisticated artificial intelligence you know plotting uh, uh, extracting information to get sleep phase they're, they're not they're not accurate yeah. the, and the other the other problem i have is so what you know, do we really know what slow wave sleep is all about? Well, sort of. I mean, we know that if people are selectively deprived of slow wave sleep, their memory isn't as good and their problem solving isn't as good. And if people are selectively deprived of REM sleep, then their emotional processing can show a bit more anxiety during the day. But in a sense, we we don't really know. Yeah. And and so I do get very frustrated because we become as a society, finally, m more sensitive to the importance of sleep. But what's happened is that a large sector have become very anxious about their sleep. Yeah. And, you know, there's these sort of sergeant majors screaming, you've got to get eight hours, you've got to do this, you can't do that. And we have to define what works for us. Yeah. And, and in fact, so many people think is the sleep is what you get, but actually it's a highly dynamic uh, a bit of our biology and we have the ability to work with it yeah. and optimise it. And I think that's, that's something that I... And, and, and the sleep apps, you know, d drive us in the opposite direction. So I, I get a bit worried. I mean, you know, 
in principle, good idea because uh, if you, it's like losing weight. If you weigh yourself every morning um, uh, and you see you've lost weight, that'll reinforce your changed eating behavior. And if you wanted to get longer sleep or different timing of sleep, as we kind of touched on, it would be a useful metric to say, yes, well, that changed behavior has worked. So, you know, getting that more morning yeah. light meant I did go to, be to bed earlier and, and I've got up earlier. So, in principle, they could be useful, but it's worth bearing in mind, none of the um, the sleep federations endorse any of the commercially available wow. devices, and none of them are FDA approved. Yeah. So we're a long way from them being, I would say, useful. Yeah, th thank you for that. That was very, very clear. I mean, that weight loss analogy, if we take it one step further, yes, if you see every day your weight is going down, let's say you are tracking that and you think that's a reasonable thing to track, Sure, it can motivate behavior, but on that one day where it goes up, and I, I read a study once which said that actually our weights can vary, but I think three to 10 pounds in any given day, I think it said, maybe yeah. three to five pounds, but yeah. just from fluid and all kinds of other yeah. stuff. But I thought, well, actually it can have a really toxic effect when you're, you're making all the right changes for yes. your health and maybe for excess weight, but actually one day it happens to actually, go the wrong way. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, what's the point? Yeah, what's, what's the, the point? Yeah. Well, I think it could be problematic. And I have a real concern over trackers in general. I'm not at all saying they can't be useful for some people. Yeah. I understand it probably depends on personality type a little bit in terms of what you do with that data. I do have a sleep tracker. I don't think I've used it for about six months. Um, it was considered one of the good ones. And I have no problem with it. You know, it was useful. There were certain things that I felt it helped me understand, which is if I eat late, it appears to really have an impact mm -hmm. on various things. But I kind of learned what I needed to learn from it. And one day, Russell, I remember waking up feeling pretty good. And I looked at my sleep score and it was rubbish. <laughs> and then my mind starts to play tricks on me. Mm. I was like, oh, and then I thought, God, am I starting to feel tired? Like, because I'm tired or because of what I've just seen? Mm. I thought, you know what? Screw this. I'm not, I don't need yeah. to use this anymore. I need to tune into myself. And I personally, I've seen, even with blood pressure monitors, I've seen patients over the years tie themselves up in knots and have health anxiety. So I guess... I would just urge a note of caution as well for people. I think that's absolutely right. And we've talked about you know, how do you know if you're getting enough sleep, what the factors are. That's the most important yeah. thing. And these are questions we can answer for ourselves without the need of a, of a health health tracker. A good, yeah. good, good friend of mine, Ken Wright, who's um, University of Colorado, um, he uh, starts his um, his class and, you know, it's a large number of students with uh, who here has ever used a sleep tracker? And, you know, essentially the whole class sort of put their hand up. And they said, who now is, is using one routinely? And about three hands go up. And, you know, these are smart people. They learn pretty quickly that these devices just uh, don't work. Yeah. Um, and you, as you've discovered, you, 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 you embrace the knowledge from your own personal experiences. Yes, yeah, yeah, to be a human. And to yes. really experience what that means. Um, just very quickly, a lot of people will often say about light exposure. Well, what about, let's say Scandinavia, for example. Uh, I guess that's top of mind because I've been recently, the hotel light in which I stayed had pretty poor blackout blinds. And so I woke up in the night mm -hmm. and then I thought it was morning and I looked at my watch, it was 3am. It, it was bright at 3am. How have people in Northern Hemisphere countries or, or other countries where there are these wildly different day and night cycles, have they evolved to that? Have they adapted to that? Do we know? Well, the short answer is no. But let me tell you about <laughs> a, a group of animals that have. And um, uh, from the University of Tromsø, they looked at Arctic reindeer. And during the two months of constant light, they turn their biological clocks off. And during the two months of constant dark, they turn their clocks off. They have no adaptive value. There is no day-night cycle. Um, and in fact, during the winter months, these reindeer uh, feed whenever the weather conditions permit. And during the summer, of course, they have to feed constantly to put on enough fat to survive the winter. So there are instances oh, where wow. clocks have been turned off because they have no adaptive value. What about humans? Well, we've, of course, been there for a very... Well, the Europeans who've moved into those, those, um, those, those places have, have shown no signs of adaptation. In fact, you know, in Tromso, a family will get up 
um, and then they'll go in the, in winter, for example, into a room where there's there's artificial light, so they'll get that morning photon shower, um, and so so they can try and stabilize. and And they use very effect, effective blackout curtains. Wow. Now, what's going on with those peoples, the native peoples who've been there for thirty, forty thousand years, isn't clear. Yeah. Um, and it may well be that there has been some adaptation, but we're we don't know. Russell, my brain is going so fast in so many different directions. Um, out of respect to your time, I'm going to stop firing questions at you and I hope I can persuade you at some point in the future for a part two. <laughs> um, to finish off this conversation, on an upbeat note, um, for people who feel inspired to prioritise their sleep, to get on top of their sleep, to basically go, you know what, Maybe it was a bit about being in your 40s to 50s and not pushing it. Whatever it might have been that connected with them. This podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of our lives. Of course, when we're going to sleep better, we're going to get more out of every aspect of our lives. So do you have any final words of wisdom, advice, practical, whatever it might be to leave uh, my listeners with? I mean, I, I think the key thing for me is that, you know, sleep is like shoe size. Um, one size does not fit all. And we as individuals need to work out what's best for us um, because there's huge individual variation and our sleep will change. So a good example would be waking up in the middle of the night. Um, so what's happened uh, is that our, uh, our sleep episode has been compressed and so we, we tend to not wake up in the middle of the night. But under uh, in societies where there's no electric light, and indeed from the literature, uh, we know our sleep patterns in the recent past were very different. Mm -hmm. So literature from the pre-industrial age uh, talks about, I had a wonderful first sleep. Um, or, uh, and sleep was biphasic, uh, going to sleep waking up, then going back to sleep again, or indeed polyphasic, which is, uh, you know, several periods of, of waking up. And because we don't know that, when people wake up in the middle of the night, they think, oh my goodness, that's it. I'm never going to get back to sleep again. I might as well start doing my emails now and um, start drinking coffee. And, and, and the key thing is that waking up in the middle of the night need not mean the end of sleep. In fact, that polyphasic or biphasic sleep pattern is what all mammals experience. Wow. And so this, again, single block of, of, of consolidated one block of sleep is not the natural state. That is such an important message, isn't it? The amount of people who feel bad that mm. they wake up. I, I know the amount of questions that get fired at me mm. about this. You know, is it okay? And you're, you're clearly saying, no, this is not only okay, it's very, very normal. Yeah. I guess this speaks to the problems with having our smartphones in our room, just yeah. looping back. I don't know, you mentioned, and not in this conversation, I've heard you say, about your relationship with your BlackBerry when you were in Australia and actually had to ultimately <laughs> yeah. leave it in your lab. Yes, I, I have, I, I'm just sort of, I think they used to be called crackberries. Um, and, and yeah, I was in Australia. And so I would do my Australian uh, emails on, on the BlackBerry. Then of course the European ones would come in and then the North American. So, so if you're jet lagged, um, and, and I remember, you know, this, this, this red blinking light, who those, those who had a BlackBerry. And I was so weak, I, I, I could not, I, first of all, it was by the bed. And of course I then moved it very quickly to the room next door and that was hopeless because I'd wake up and then I'd go next door and so um, I left it in the lab and of course as a result I got much better sleep <laughs> yeah because when you wake up if you're not getting your mind actively exactly. engaged back into work yeah. you a lot of us probably don't realise that we may well have fallen asleep again yes, had we and, not done and that. that's what most of us do. In yeah. fact, you know, we go through cycles of REM and non-REM and we naturally wake from, from REM sleep and then we fall back to sleep again without even noticing it. Yeah. Now, that wake-up period can be, you know, a, a few seconds so you don't notice it or it may be 30 minutes. But the chances are you will go back to sleep as long as you stay relaxed, you keep the lights low, and you do something that is not alerting the brain. And as I say, because we haven't ever passed this information on, you know, people don't know when they think, oh my goodness, that's the end of sleep, I'm yeah. sleeping terribly. And in fact, if you stay calm, um, it's fine. The other thing, another tip, I guess, would be illuminated alarm clocks. Because many people clock watch, they'll wake up and then they think, oh my God, I've only got two hours before I, the alarm goes off. 
it doesn't matter. You know, if you go back to sleep, you know, it, and you have that additional two hours or half an hour, again, it doesn't matter. So if you have an illuminated clock, put a, some tape over the front of it. The only thing that matters, I guess, is the alarm, not how long you've got before the alarm goes off. To dive deeper into your health and well-being, check out this masterclass on why so many of us feel tired all of the time and what we can do to change it. When you feel tired all the time, it affects three key components of your life. Your health, your happiness, but also your relationships. 